the bell icon to turn on notifications. We've made the accompanying exercise files for this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. What is Power BI? Power BI is a self-service BI solution provided by Microsoft. It is aimed at the end user who doesn't necessarily have a technical background and know about databases or has experience in programming. It takes the hands out of the IT department or the need to hire a freelancer and enables that general end user who may have a background in Excel to be able to create powerful and interactive reports. There are two parts to Power BI. There is the Power BI desktop, which will form most of this course. That is the software where we create our model and our reports. And then there is PowerBI.com, otherwise known as the Power BI service, which is where we publish our reports and we can create dashboards and share it with our audience. It contains functionality for users to be able to interact with our reports, but nowhere near the features that we will have in Power BI Desktop to actually create them. So what makes up Power BI? Well, first of all, it has Power Query. Some of you may have experience of this through Excel, and that will be an advantage to you if you do. It's the same feature, and it's available in Power BI for us to import data from a huge variety of sources. There are many connections available, and more coming out as we speak. We can use Power Query to transform and shape that data ready to be loaded into the model. Once it's in the data model, we can create our relationships between our tables, which is a much more efficient and effective way of modeling our data versus the classic Excel approach where we would have one large table and we would use formulas like VLOOKUP to fetch data from other places and bring them into that one list ready to analyze on. In Power BI, we will be focusing on coming away from that flat file, that one big list, working with separate tables and relating them. This means we can work with huge volumes of data. We also have DAX, Data Analysis Expressions, a very rich formula language that is constantly growing and allows us, if needed, to create powerful calculations. We then have the powerful reporting features. There are a huge amount of visualizations and even more that we could import into Power BI. And there are also many ways of interacting, filtering and highlighting different areas of our reports. These are all built in so they do not require huge technical skills to be able to operate. They are fresh out the box so that we can create amazing reports in just a matter of minutes. And then it comes to distributing these reports and typically it will be published to the service, powerbi.com for sharing, but it can also be embedded into a website and remain fully interactive and even more options such as PowerPoint presentations, PDF, or even just sharing the Power BI desktop file itself, just like you would share a Word document, a PDF, or an Excel spreadsheet already. So that is Power BI. Let's get into the good stuff. Now that we have spoken about what Power BI is, if you don't already have the software, the next step is to get it. Now, one way that we can do that is navigate to this URL or just simply type Power BI Desktop into Google 
and you will be taken to a page where you can download the software ready for use. That's one approach. An easier way of downloading the software would be to come into the Microsoft Store. So if I click on my Microsoft Store from my Start button, and I can search for the Power BI Desktop app in here. If I click on my search button in the top right corner, type Power BI and give the desktop a click. I already have this software installed, so I can see a launch button where there would have been an install button if I didn't have this software. I can see that the product is already installed on the left as well. And by installing Power BI Desktop, taking this approach, you can be confident that it will constantly update with the new releases that come out regularly. If you're interested, you can also scroll down and find a little bit more information here about what Power BI Desktop is. They have some nice bullet points here mentioning about how you can extend your data model with DAX and that they have over 100 cutting edge visuals and various information, some of which I've mentioned. And also if you scroll down, you can see some of the more technical details about how much size this will take on your machine. But nice and simple, you can install Power BI Desktop from here and follow along with this course. Let's have a quick little tour of Power BI Desktop before we get a grip of our data and really start having some fun. Now, when you open up Power BI Desktop for the first time, you will encounter this welcome screen. And I wanted to show this screen because it can be quite useful. You have access to recent files that you've been using on the left and the opportunity to go and get new data or use recent sources in reports. But more importantly, I think, especially when you're starting out, is what's happening in the yellow side. We have some video tutorials, but on the right hand side, we have access to what is new, forums to get assistance from the Power BI community, and also the Power BI blog. And this is important because Power BI is updating very regularly. Every month there are new features to Power BI Desktop and Microsoft will release a video to tell everybody about these features. But because of this fast evolving software, although that's brilliant as a user, that we're getting a more efficient and more powerful piece of software, it does mean that we need to be aware of what's changing. So that if one of our favorite buttons suddenly moves, we know that and we can find it again. Or if there's a new DAX function that's better than the old one, we want to know about it. If you do not want to see this screen anymore, there is a nice tick box at the bottom so we can ask it not to show this again on startup. But maybe you want to bookmark some of those links first. I can see my name in the top right corner because I am signed in with my Microsoft account. If I close this welcome screen for now, this is Power BI Desktop. We have a ribbon along the top, just like any other Microsoft product, although some of them may have a different name, such as modeling. And we have a view tab, just like any other application, also an insert and a home tab, most important of all. On the left hand side, we have three different views. We have a report view, which is the view we are on at the moment. And that is illustrated by that small yellow bar. And the report view is literally a blank canvas so that we can insert and arrange our visualizations and other tiles into a stunning looking report. It has some pages at the bottom, just like you would have different sheets of an Excel workbook. 
and we start off with one page to our report. And on the far right hand side, there are three different panes by default. There's a filters pane with some really useful filtering options that we will be looking at. We have a visualizations pane with access to a variety of visuals such as cards and charts and maps and slices. Underneath that, we have a fields and a formatting icon that will provide options for us to work with those visualizations. And this is all theoretical at the moment, but we will be getting our hands on those very soon. We also have a fields pane, and for those of you with some experience of pivot tables in Excel, that will look very familiar. Coming back to the left hand side, that was the report view. But we also have this data view. And at the moment, it does not look like much because we don't have any data. But you will see a formula bar along the top, which you'll recognize. And when we do have data, this will look like Excel. We will see our data structured as a table. We also have a field list on the right hand side, just like the previous view. We then have this model view. And this is a really useful view. Once again, it doesn't look like much, although we do have a nice diagram illustrating what it's used for. And we will primarily be using this view to establish the relationships between our different tables and to be able to manage them moving forward. But there's also a lot of other cool things we can do in this view. And over on the right hand side, we have the fields pane again. And we also have a properties pane, which we will be using in this course. I'll come back to the report view, which is the main view of Power BI Desktop. But all three of those have their uses and we will be making the most of them. Before we go any further, I'm going to save this blank file ready for when we start importing our data and creating our model. So just like any other Microsoft file, I can click on file and save as. And from this typical looking save as screen, I will navigate to the documents folder where I'm going to save this give it a nice file name, such as Power BI Course. And you can see it has a .pbix extension. So a Power BI file is just like any other file and anybody I share it with can also open it in Power BI Desktop. If I click on Save, and we have our new Power BI file ready to work with. Hello, in this lesson, I wanted to explore some of the default Power BI options and those of particular interest. So if I click on File, and come down to options and settings, and then from here, options. And there's quite a lot to see in here, but I wanted to look at three different categories. And I wanted to begin with the preview features in this global section. So any changes we make here affects your Power BI desktop installation and how any files that you create will behave. And if I click on preview features, this is what it looks like at the time of recording, which is April 2020. And I've already mentioned in a previous lesson how Power BI is constantly being updated. So you can see that I have three features 
enabled here and others that I have not. But these are features that are available for us to try and they may even change or be removed in future releases, in future updates of Power BI. And I wanted to bring your attention to this because one, at the time of you watching this video, things may have changed or you may not be seeing, for example, a ribbon that looks like mine. But I am previewing the updated ribbon. So please expect some changes over time because they are happening for the good. But also, this is an area you can come if you're interested in using some of these features in preview. Now further down this options window, we have the settings for the current file. So any changes in here will only affect this Power BI course file that I saved in the previous lesson. And there's two categories I'm interested in here. One is data load, where we have a few checkboxes that are quite commonly referenced by Power BI users. The first one is the type detection. And this is Power Query, which we're going to see in the next module of this course. And Power Query by default automatically detects column types. And it's very good at doing that, so it can be useful. But some people also find it frustrating, so it's quite common for people to come here and uncheck that box. However, I'm going to leave that one checked so that we can see that in action, especially for those of you who may not be so familiar with Power Query. Now in the next section down, we have some settings on relationships, and I am going to uncheck the auto detect new relationships after data is loaded. Once again, Power BI is very good at doing that. Very effective at working out the relationships that need to be there. However, I don't want it doing it here. I'm interested in us getting our hands on and creating those relationships ourselves. The next category is the regional settings. And in here, I am set as English United Kingdom because that is where I reside. But this is the locale for how Power BI interprets your numbers, your dates, and your times. Now I'm going to leave mine as English UK, but it's worth bearing in mind that just because you might reside in the UK or the US or wherever else, that may not necessarily be the data you work with. Now this is something we can still change in Power BI, so it's not that important that we modify this setting, because we could change the locale after import. But if you're regularly receiving data from other countries, so for example, if I'm regularly receiving data that's constructed in a US date format or in a European number format, it would make sense for me to change this setting to work with that data. Because just because I'm in the UK doesn't mean my data is being structured in a UK format. And that would save me some time and potentially some issues. So they are three different categories in here, but there's quite a few options that you might be interested in tweaking for your Power BI experience. I'll click OK to confirm the changes that I have made, and let's progress into getting some data. It is now time to get started on our reports. And the first thing we need to do is get some data. And in this first example, I'm going to import multiple CSV files from a folder. And these CSV files contain sales data. So the scenario here is that we have a coffee shop and we have multiple shops around the world in different locations. And the transactional data is in these files. So this is the folder called sales and it's in my documents folder. But for you, it will be wherever you have downloaded and saved this material. You can see in here 
that we have four files, all of them are CSVs, and they have a consistent naming of sales and the year. So we have four years worth of random and fictional data. Back into Power BI, on the Home tab, if we click on Get Data, this will drop down a list of common data sources, and Folder is not on that list. So if I click on More, this will expand into a window with the complete list of data sources. Now we have different categories down the left hand side, but if I just scroll down this all list for a moment, you can see the volume of data sources that you can use in Power BI, and this is constantly growing. We can see PDF in here, and as I move down, some very common data sources that you may use or at least be aware of. So we have Google Analytics, a LinkedIn sales navigator, GitHub, and the list goes on and on. So this is really cool, and you might find the software that you use in here ready to rock. If I scroll back up, because folder was near the top of the list, I'll select that and click connect. First of all, it will ask us to browse or provide the path for that folder. Now mine is on the documents folder. So if I click on browse and expand libraries, I can choose documents, scroll down a little bit, and there is my sales folder. If I click OK, the path is put into that folder path field, and click on OK will now connect to that. And we see a window listing all of the files that it can find in that folder. Now in this example, it is only the CSVs. At the bottom, there are a few buttons for some actions. It is always encouraged to go straight for transform data. We will be combining it very soon, but it's always a good habit to click on transform data so you get the opportunity to look at it before you start taking any major steps. We now see the list of files in the Power Query Editor. Now we are not going to spend a huge amount of time on Power Query in this course. For that, if you're new to this tool, you will need to find yourself a Power Query course for some more in-depth information. We will be covering a variety of transformations and Power Query features over the next few lessons, but it's a much larger tool than what we can go into any serious detail in this course. But at this point, if there were files in that folder that we did not want to use, we could filter them out, maybe using the extension column to avoid any PDFs or Excel workbooks that might be in here. For us, we are going to combine it. This is exactly what we want. And there's a button, a double arrow button in the header of the content column. And if I click on that, it's going to open up all four of those files and stack them into one big list. We get this window first, giving us an insight to those files. We are happy with this. If I click OK, it's going to take a little while to combine those and we get that complete list. We have the name of the file in the first column, and then we have the order ID, the date of the transaction, the sale. We have the product, and also in the same column, the name of the shop's location, and then the country code for the country that that shop resides in, or that location is found in. We then have the all important amount. Now the file name in the first column can be very useful in analysis sometimes, but for us right now, it's not needed. I don't need the year in its name because I have the year in the date field. So I'm simply going to right mouse click on that column and remove it. Now in Power Query, on the right hand side, as we go through these transformations, we have an applied steps pane listing every step that we take. 
So in the future, when we have our report going, we can just refresh this and every step is updated. Power Query is absolutely amazing. Now there's a lot of steps in there at the moment. We don't need to worry about any of them really, apart from the source and then the remove columns which we just performed ourselves, Because those steps were done by the importing from a folder and then the combining into one list. And Power Query did it so that we don't have to worry about it. If I was to make a mistake and I realized that I don't want to remove that column really, I could just click on that small black X next to that step and it is removed. And that is your undo button of Power Query. On the far left, we have a queries pane. And once again, there's a lot of queries because Power Query generated those when it combined the files. The only one that we're interested in as part of this course, because we can't go into that detail, is the sales query. Now to carry on through some transformations, we can see we have a product column and we need to separate the product name and the location of the shop. So I'm going to select the product column and from the home tab, click on split column. There's some really cool options in here, but we want by delimiter. It automatically assesses the column and assumes we want that open bracket, which we do, but I'm going to put a space before it as well. So it removes that space between the product name and the bracket. We then get the option to where to split it at. Will it be each occurrence? I'm going to change that to rightmost delimiter. In this example, it shouldn't make any difference. In fact, I know it makes no difference because there are no other brackets in that column. But I'm choosing rightmost delimiter because if it was to suddenly become an issue, I know the locations on the end of the column, therefore it will be the rightmost. Click OK, we'll perform that split and produce a new column as a result. We now have a product column and this location column. Now I want to remove that closed bracket from the location. So if I select that column and there's a button called replace values nearby that split column button. In here, I will ask it to replace the closed bracket with nothing and click OK and that bracket is removed. As we go through these steps, on the right hand side, you can see all the applied steps taking place. And you may remember from the previous video on Power BI options, where there was an option to auto detect the data type. And you can see in applied steps, I have two change type steps. Nothing that serious, but that was that setting, automatically generating these data type changes. And that's why some people like to disable that. So you don't get too many of those. But I've left them there, they're not doing any harm and I wanted us to see that. I'm now going to rename those columns. If I double click on the first one and call it product, and then double click on the second one and call it location. Now I'm going to double check the data types myself. So although they auto detected it, they may not have it correct. Now the first column, you can see a small icon indicating one, two, three, that that is storing whole numbers, and that's great. The second column has a date icon, so that's a date. In product, we have text, and location is also text, as is the country code, all of them perfect. Now the final one for amount, that 1.2 indicates a decimal value which the amount is. But I'm going to click on that little icon because it's actually a button and that allows us to change that data type. And I'm changing it to a fixed decimal so that when I click on that, all of the results have two decimal places, it's fixed. That now means we have three change type steps on the right hand side. The final step in here for the moment is going to be to rename this query. In the properties pane on the right, it's named sales. I'm going to rename that as sales 
prep because this is not actually the finished result yet. In a couple of lessons time, we're going to work off this query. This is just the initial preparation. It's not perfect for us yet. So I've named it sales prep, and now I'm going to close and apply to load this into our Power BI model. Close and apply is on the home tab on the very far left. If I click on that, it will take a little while here just to load this into our model because it's quite a large set of data. And here we have it on the fields list on the right, we can see all the data is loaded. We have our sales prep table and then it's fields. We have a calendar icon next to the date field and we have this sum icon, this sigma, indicating the numeric fields from that query. Now that is a little over a million rows of data. Just to quickly show that off with the first visual of this course, in its visualizations area, if I click on a card icon, that will dump this card tile into our report. And I'm going to drag the order ID field into this fields area to its left. That will count the order IDs by default just to show that we have loaded 1.2 million rows of data from those four CSV files. In this lesson, we are going to import data from two more sources. Now, the first source will be an Excel workbook. So from the Home tab, I have an Excel button on there ready to be used. So if I click on Excel, the open window appears and is on my documents folder. I can now scroll to the workbook that I need, which is this one called Countries. If I select Countries and click Open, it connects to the Excel workbook and takes me to this navigator window listing all of the elements within it. And I can see that there is a table named country and also a sheet named sheet one. Now, if I was to select the country table, I will see a preview on the right hand side. And as you would expect, it is some information about countries. A nice simple table here but there could have been lots of fields with information about these countries. And these are the countries referenced from the sales data we imported in the previous lesson. If I click on the sheet, I also get a preview of that. And these two elements are showing me the exact same set of data. Now, because I have that data in a table already, it makes sense for me to choose the table over the worksheet. But we could have imported data from a sheet. If I click on transform data at the bottom, I am pretty confident that this data is ready to be used. But it's always a good practice to click on transform data and check your data out before you load it. So here it is in the Power Query Editor. The query is added to the left hand side in the queries pane. And over on the right hand side, we have the applied steps and we have the name of the query. I'm just going to put a capital C in the query name there. And in the applied steps, you can see the connection to the source, the navigation to the table, and then the auto detection of change type, which if we look at our data, both columns are text data types, and that's correct. So this query is already ready to be used, no transformations or any other data shaping required. Now I'm going to stay within the Power Query Editor, and I'm not going to load this to Power BI yet, because there is another data source that we want to connect to. And this one is a text file. So from within Power Query, 
I can click on the new source drop down on the home tab and I can see text is an option from this list but just like in the previous lesson if I needed to connect to a folder or to a PDF or something that is not listed in this quickfire list I can click on more to get that large complete list that we saw. I'm going to click on text slash CSV that will take me to the documents folder and this products file is the one that I want to use. So after selecting I will click open. I have this preview of the text file showing me the ID of the product, its name and then a category that it has been assigned to. Looks great, I'll click on OK. And now it's into Power Query where if needed I could perform some transformations. But just like with the Excel workbook, this looks good. On the right hand side I will capitalize the name of products and once again the applied steps, the source the promotion of the headers and then that change type step. Now when you're looking at these applied steps you can click on them to see what your data looked like at that point in time. So I could click on that source step and in my formula bar above I can see the file path of that product's file. So if I ever needed to change that for any reason if that file was to be moved, then I can do so at that source step. And I don't need to recreate this connection all over again. There is also a gear icon to the right of that step name. And rather than editing it in the formula bar, I could click on that gear icon and it would take me to this window where I could then browse for where my new file or where that file may have been moved to. I can click on cancel for now. Not all steps on the right have a gear icon for simple editing, but some of them do. And that can be really useful so that you don't have to redo those steps. As I mentioned, because that source is selected, we are looking at our data in that point in time. So if you look at the data in the middle, you can see the headers are in the first row and not in the header. But then the next step is that Power Query automatically promoted them into the header area. And now in the data, we can see they're in the headers. And then it applied the change type step, which in this example was simply to change the ID into a whole number. It's always good practice to check those data types and all three of them are good. We have a whole number, text, and then another text field. So I'm happy with this. From the Home tab, we can click Close and Apply to close the editor, load this data into Power BI. And here we have it on the right-hand side in the field list. We now have those three tables, country, products and sales prep. As you work through the lessons of this course, each lesson builds on the last. So you can continue to use your same Power BI report. However, for each lesson, I have also provided the file that I am using. There is something you'll need to bear in mind though if you're going to use the files provided by myself. And that is the source of the queries. For example, in this Power BI report, if I was to insert a table visual and drag the country field from the country table into values for that visual, and then look at refreshing it. So if I click refresh from the home tab and that queries group, then you can see we have a problem. All three queries are blocked due to the country query. 
where it could not find the file from the location that it states there. So let me close down that window and we will go and investigate and fix that issue. But this is something that you are likely to encounter yourself if you're using the files that I provide and they are going to be using the same source as demoed in this video. So from the home tab, next to that refresh button, we can transform data. And this will reopen the Power Query Editor with the queries on the left hand side. Now at the moment, they all look great. But if I click the Refresh Preview button inside the Power Query Editor, if I expand the button and refresh all queries, I can now see the problem on the left only with the country query. So let me select that country query. And here we have our error where it cannot find the file in that location. On the right hand side, we have the applied steps. And if I click on the source step, we can now edit that and fix that issue either by using the formula bar and editing the path provided there, or I can click the little gear icon to the right of that source step to reopen this window and simply browse to the location of that file. So if I click browse, and it's still in this documents folder, but I have this country data subfolder there. And in there, that is where this country's Excel workbook now resides. It has been moved by somebody in this pretend scenario. But if I open that and OK, that now correctly pulls that new source in. If I close and apply this to the Power BI report, it can now successfully apply those query changes. So that was just a small demonstration of how you can go back into the query editor and edit the source of your queries. I only changed the country query. You may need to do that for every query if you're using one of the files that I've provided uh, because naturally the location I've put them in may not exist in your setup. So make sure you change the source where you have downloaded and made these course files available. In this lesson, we need to normalize our model. Let's have a look at what I mean. On the Home tab of Power BI, if I click on Transform Data, this will reopen the Power Query Editor so that we can see the three queries we currently have, which is Sales Prep, Country and Products. Now, Sales Prep is our transactional table, otherwise known as the Fact Table or the Data Table. This is our large 1.2 million rows of sales over these four years. Now you want to keep these tables as skinny as possible. They're going to be long, especially if you're successful, because we're going to have many sales. But we want as few columns as possible. Now looking at this table, we have a product location and country code columns. Now the country code column is not necessary. We don't want it in here because we have a location and we can find the country through the location. The product and the location, we do. However, I would like to use some index numbers there as a reference to the product and location and not the names of them. This will make our fact table fast to interrogate through our DAX formulas and our visualizations. So I want to create a location table. We don't have one at the moment. We have country, we have products, we don't have location. So in the queries pane on the left, 
I'm going to right mouse click on sales prep and there is an option to reference this table. There is an option for duplicate and an option for reference. Both of them would work, but it would be better to reference this query because duplicate would duplicate all of those transformation steps plus the connection to the source folder that that query does. If I reference it, I get another query from that, but only one of them is connected to that source folder. Now with this new one, I'm going to immediately rename it by right mouse clicking again and renaming, and it's going to be called location. And you can see in the formula bar that the source is just a reference to the other query equal sales prep. Now, if we look at the data, we want this table to be about location. So I'm going to select the location column and hold down control to select the country column. And with them both selected, I will right mouse click and remove other columns so that we are just left with the location and the country code. Now that we have this, I want to remove the duplicates from location because at the moment we still have those 1.2 million odd rows. So with location selected on the home tab, there is a remove rows button. There's some really good options in that drop down. The one we want, remove duplicates will strip out all the duplicate mentions of a location, leaving us with our 48 locations. Now that we have that, I want to select the country code column so that next to remove rows, I can sort the country code in ascending order, giving us Australia and Austria at the top now the location names in this example are unique. There's no duplications, although that is something that can happen. There are towns and cities across the world which, are, which share the same name. Here they are unique, but it's good practice to have an index number as a unique identifier. Often your data will already have this index. It will have an employee number or a product code that's typically generated by a system. Here we don't have that, so I'm going to click on the Add Column tab, and then the drop down arrow for Index Column, so that I can insert an Index Column starting from one. That will include it at the end of our data set. Here it is. So my next step is to click and drag it to the start, because it's always nice to have your key field as the first column. I'm going to change its name, the header, to location ID as a more creative name than index. And then our final step really is just to double check those data types like we do. So the first data type is a decimal number. Now these are whole numbers. So I'm going to click on that and change its whole number and then location and country code are text data types, which is great. So all of these steps, just like the previous queries, have been added in applied steps on the right. So if we ever refresh this data, the data will come in from the files in that folder into sales prep, transformations happen, and then this query is linked to that one, so that then this table is generated. So now we have our location table. Let's click on home and then close and apply to load it into the Power BI model. And there it is in the fields list on the right hand side. Now that we have that location table, we want to create a new and improved sales fact table. So let's begin by clicking transform data to bring us back to the Power Query editor. 
and we're going to do this by using merge queries, a brilliant feature of Power Query. And on the sales prep table, up in the home tab, merge queries is on the end. And I want to click the drop down arrow so that I can specify to merge queries as a new query. I don't want to affect the current sales prep query because my location query is referencing it from the previous lesson. I want a new query, which will be our sales fact query. Now in the merge window, I have the sales prep table selected because I began the merge query from it. But then I have this drop down list where I can specify the location table. So what I want to do here is bring in the location ID from the location query or table so that in the sales table, I can remove the location column and also the country column. And the location ID will be used to reference that data. So in the first query, I'm going to select the location column. And then in the second one, select the location column. Because at the moment, that is being used to join or to identify the data in the two tables. At the bottom of the window, it's just estimating my matches and has confirmed that we have a complete match. Now there are different join kinds available in here, which is not something we're going to get into detail with now. That information will be provided by a more in-depth Power Query course. But this is a very powerful feature with six different join kinds. For us right now, the left outer join is what we need. So if I click OK, that will perform the merge and bring the location table into this new query. Now with this table in the header, there is a button to expand the table data. So if I click on that button, it will ask me what fields from that table would you like? Now we just want location ID. So I'm removing location, removing country code, and also removing the original column name as a prefix. If I click OK, the location ID is brought into this table. Here it is. So I'm going to click and drag that column into position. And then I can select the location column, hold control and select the country code column, right click and remove them. Because now I have that index, that ID, I can use that to reference the data in the other tables. I don't need them in this big over 1 million row fat table. This is good practice. Keeps our model small and also efficient in respect of our speed of calculations. I now want to repeat that process for the product. I have a product name in here, but I want to replace it with an index number. So this time, I'm going to click on the Merge Queries button. I don't want a new one. This time I'm changing the existing query. So if I click Merge Queries, it will open this merge window again. The current merge one table is selected. From the drop down, I'm choosing Products. And the match will be the Product column in the first table, Product column in the second table. And that should return a complete match. There it is. I'll click OK to bring that table into this query. Expand the table and bring in only the ID column. If I click OK, 
and then drag ID before product. It's not necessary to order these columns in this way. I just like the amount column to be the one on the end. I can now remove the product column because I don't need it anymore. That ID will be the reference to that information in the products table. I will rename that header instead of ID, which makes sense in the products table because it's about products. But now I'm in the sales table, I need to be more specific that that is the product ID. Otherwise that could get very confusing. So now we have three ID columns in this table. We have the order ID, the identifier of our orders, but then we have product ID and location ID, which are going to become foreign keys for the products and locations table. And we'll see that when we're creating our relationships in a few lessons time. We definitely need to rename this query. So on the right hand side, merge one is not very meaningful or creative. I'm going to call it sales. So now this is the sales table that we'll use. The previous one was just a, a staging step for the, the location table and now the new sales table. If I click on close and apply to now load this data into our Power BI model. In this lesson, we are going to prevent our sales prep table from being loaded into Power BI. At the moment in the field list on the right, we can see the sales table and sales prep. Now we do not need them both, and although sales prep is not causing any harm, it is creating unnecessary clutter and confusion. And also time loading that into the model when we refresh. So if I click on my home tab and transform data to go back into that Power Query editor, and in the queries pane on the left, I'm going to right mouse click on sales prep and uncheck the enable load. I am warned about possible data loss and then it may break visuals in my report, but that's not going to be a problem. So I will click on continue and the sales prep table on the left is italicized, illustrating that it will not be loaded into the model. So it will still do all the query steps here. Everything will still function fine. And the tables that we've got reference in it will function fine. It just won't be loaded into the model, which we're going to work on over the remainder of this course. So if I click close and apply, bringing us back to Power BI, and in the field list on the right, we no longer have the sales prep table. Now on our report page, I can now see something has gone wrong with our visual, which is what I was warned about with that possible data loss warning. So it was correct to warn me. However, that visual is the card that we used in a previous lesson to check the number of rows in our sales data. And I used the sales prep table back then. If I wanted to check it again now, I could select that visual and over on the right hand side, remove the current field it's using, which it cannot find because it's not loaded into the model. And I could open up the new sales table and move the order ID back into fields. And now I have the same result as earlier. However, that's not a visual we're going to use. So with it selected, I'm just going to remove it by pressing delete. And we have the data that we're now going to start working on in our model and ultimately our DAX and our visuals. Hello and welcome to the practice exercise for the module on getting and transforming data in Power BI. Go ahead and open file 
two hyphen six practice exercise and follow the instructions found on the instructions page. There is a completed version of this file named 2-6 practice exercise complete for you to check your work against. Have fun. For the next section, you'll want to download the course exercise files. Click the link below in the video description to get these. You can also scroll through the details to find timestamps for each section in this course. If you're enjoying this training, please leave us a comment. It is now time to create the relationships between the four tables in our model. At the moment, if I was to try and create a visualization that includes data from different tables, it's not going to work. Let me show that. In the visualizations pane, if I bring in a visual such as a table, if I click the table to put that tile onto my page, and then if I open up the products table and I drag the category field into the values area, it successfully lists the three different categories of product that we have. If I then drag the amount field from the sales table into values, it doesn't show me the correct value for each category. You can see I've got the same number four times. Now the value for the total is correct. 4.3 million, let's call it, is a correct figure. But we've got the same figure for the categories. It doesn't understand how to filter that total for pastries, food, and beverages. So it just shows the same total. Now that is because we don't have a relationship between the two tables, providing that filter context through the category and then into that fact table for the correct totals. So let me leave the visual there, but switch to the model view on the left hand side. If I click on model, here is our model view. Looks a little bit messy to begin with because for some reason the tables are always all over the place. <laughs> so in addition to creating relationships, one of the first jobs is just to drag these in to some kind of meaningful position. So I could just drag them using their headers into view let me scroll over for the sales one. And you can position these how you like, but there are some quite common ways of positioning these tables. And I'm taking this approach of having the sales table, our fact table, our data table at the bottom, and then the lookup tables, also known as your dimension tables up above. Now let me move products over to the right so that location is next to country because they are related like this. And now we can create the relationships. Now there's a few different ways of doing this, but the easiest way is just to drag between the two fields of the tables. So for example, to create a relationship between sales and products, the common identifier is that ID or in sales, it's known as the product ID. So from the sales table, I'll hover my mouse over product ID, so I have that gray background, click and drag up to the ID column in products, which is the unique identifier that we created, and release my mouse, and there is the relationship. We have a one-to-many relationship, from the products table of lookup into the sales table. A product can be sold many times. The ID is unique in products, but it's not in sales. And we also have this arrow on the line indicating the filter direction. So in the visual that we created previously, 
it will filter the category in products to pastries, food and beverages, and then produce the right total in sales. So if we wanted to check that out now, if I switch back to report view, it's working brilliantly. We now have the correct totals. Let's go back into our model view to create the other relationships. So for this next one, I'm going to drag from the location ID field in sales up to the location table and it will correctly establish that there's a relationship between location ID and location ID. Once again, a one-to-many relationship. It filters through locations into sales. I can then create a relationship between location and country. If I click and drag from country code in location to country code in country, I now have a one-to-many relationship there as well because a country can have many locations. Some of them only have one, most of them have more than one location. If I hover my mouse over any of these relationship lines, it highlights the two key fields. So you can do that to double check that Power BI is using the right fields. You will certainly notice when you try and use them in the visual, like we have at the moment with our category sales. I know this product is working because of that visual, but just hovering over is a nice peace of mind illustration. We also have a manage relationships button up on the home tab. And if I clicked on that button, this will also provide information on those existing relationships and also the opportunity at the bottom to delete, edit, or even ask Power BI to alter detect them so that we don't have to create them ourselves. But bear in mind, it might make mistakes. So it's nice to be hands-on and set this up because if these don't work, then neither will our DAX or our visualizations effectively. I'm going to close this window and that is our relationships done. We have one more lookup table which I would like to add to our model and that is a dates table. There are three main reasons why your model should have a dates table. Reason number one is that whenever we use a date in a visual or in a DAX formula, Power BI creates an invisible date table on the fly. Now by creating our own date table and marking it as one, Power BI knows what to use. That then means that we can write more powerful DAX time intelligence formulas because we will have the information to work with them. The third reason is that by creating our own dates table, we can create the fields which we would like to use in our report. At the moment, the only date column we have are the dates of the orders in the sales table. But we might want to do analysis on the day of the week or on a financial year. And this is information which we don't actually have at the moment. We only have the order date. But we can create these fields, these columns, in our dates table, ready for the analysis. Now we are going to create this dates table using DAX, the data analysis expressions formula language. So I'm going to click on data view. And in here, we are going to create a new table. And there's a button for new table up on the ribbon, which as I move my mouse over it, tells me to write a DAX expression to create the new table. Let's give it a click and it simply opens up the formula bar. Now our dates table needs to include every single date within the range that our model uses. So for example, we have the dates in the sales table. There may be 
dates in that table where we didn't sell anything. But they must be included in this dates table. Every single date within the range that our model uses. Our model does not have any future dates because we only have a date of a sale. But you may be working with a model that does have future dates, such as expiry dates of something or expected delivery dates. And we need to take this into account. So I'm going to write a DAX formula to bring a list of every single date within all the years of our model. Now I know that this one goes from 2016 to 2019 because that's the date we imported earlier, but I want this to be dynamic. When somebody adds 2020 as a CSV file, this formula has to pick it up. Let's start with the name of our table and I'm simply going to call it dates. Equals. And as soon as I put that in, a list of DAX functions appear. I can also see the country table in that list. So we get this IntelliSense list, just like Excel, when you're writing your formulas and functions. Now DAX is such a large and rich language, we are merely touching the fringes of it in this course. This is not a DAX course, it's a Power BI course. So although we're going to write some DAX here, we're also going to do more in the following module. In the grand scheme of things, it is just a finger prick of what is possible. The function we need right now though is one called calendar. And this function returns a table, which is important because we're creating a new table, of all the dates between a start date and end date. So if I press my tab key to finish that off. Now a great thing in that formula bar is that we can zoom it in. So it does appear a little bit small on your screen. I can hold down the control key on the keyboard and roll my mouse wheel up and that formula bar gets larger and helps us see what's going on a little bit easier. Now the start date is what we need to find out and I want this to be dynamic. I know it's 2016 in this example, but you may have models that are rolling with time and you need that dynamism. So I'm going to start with the date function and open that up so it prompts for the year, month, day of a date. And for the year, I'm going to use the year function of the minimum date. So I'm going to type min, that will prompt me for a column name of which to find the smallest number, the minimum number. And I'm going to reference the sales table and the date column. Now for any of you who have written Excel formulas working with tables in Excel before, this is going to look very familiar. If you haven't, this may look a little bit different. There are similarities, but there's also more differences to what you might be used to. So we have the sales table and then a column name with square brackets around it, and that's the notation. I'm going to select that and then close off the min function, return the smallest number, i.e. the earliest date, another close bracket for year to extract the year from that. Comma then prompts me for the month. The month is one, comma the day is one, close bracket for date. So that is the 1st of January of the earliest year in our data set. I can now put in a comma and repeat that behavior for the end date, but this time using the max function. So it's date, what's the year? Well, it's the year of the maximum date from that sales date column, comma, the month is 12, the day is 31, and then I'll close off that date function and close off the calendar function. So I've given it a dynamic start and end date by simply finding the smallest and largest uh, numbers in the dates column and extracting the years from them. And there are various techniques for doing this. You can also do this in Power Query. I've decided on a DAX approach. When I press enter, it returns a table, which will essentially be a list of all of the dates in that range. 
Now at the moment I'm on my country table that does not look like dates. So I will click on the dates table on the far right. And there we have it. Starting from the 1st of Jan 2016 all the way to the 31st of December 2019. And in the bottom right it tells me that there are 1461 rows in this data. Now I can see it's brought back the date and also the time. So I'm going to select that column and on the ribbon above I'm going to specify that I only want the date data type. In this model we are not working with any time so it's not important for us. I could if I wanted as well specify some formatting up here. So at the moment it's got the 1st of January 2016. I could use this drop down and change the format. So maybe I'll switch it to a classic DDMMYY format as we use here in the UK. And there we have it. But regardless of your formatting, we have that list of dates and it is dynamic. In the next video, we're going to start adding the additional columns to this dates table that we may use in our analysis. In this lesson, we will create the additional columns in our dates table that we may want to use in our report. Now we're going to be using DAX here, creating calculated columns. There are two main types of DAX formula, calculated columns, which we're using now, and measures, which we cover in the next module. So let's look at these calculated columns. We've seen a DAX formula returning that list of dates, that table. And if I return back to the Home tab, there is also a button for New Column. So if I click on that, now we need to use DAX for a column, much the same way as the previous one. Now this first one will be for the year. So I'm going to call it year equals, and nice and easy, it's going to be the year function, and I'm going to use the date column that we just created. Now, even though the date column is right next to where we are right now, I'm going to reference the dates table and then the date column. And that may sound a little bit strange, why I mention the dates table because we are in the dates table right now. Why does that benefit us? Why should we bother? Well, the way that the date field looks with the square brackets around it is exactly the same as what a measure looks like. And we'll see that in the next module. For the moment, just take my word for that. So because they look the same, it's always encouraged to put the table name before the column name because then people looking at your DAX will know it's a column and not confuse it for a measure. So it's date, date, close bracket, and that, when I hit enter, will return the years from the column next to it. Let's go for another new column. We've got a few to add here. Next column is going to be for the month. Now I'm going to call it month number because that's what it's going to do. And we're going to use the month function. Probably no surprise there. And it's dates, table, date, column. Very similar to before, so going through at a reasonable speed. And now we have the month numbers. Now the next column is going to be something a little bit different because this time I want the month name, such as January, April. Now for this one, I'm going to use a function called format, which converts a value to text in a specified number format. And the value is going to be the date table date column again, comma, but the format will be to show the word. So I'm going to open up some double quotes and put three M's in there. Now if I put four M's, it will be January and September. But when it comes to the report, I don't really need 
the full month name. And often we're trying to conserve space. So the three letters will suffice. Just to demonstrate this, if I do put four M's in, close off those quotes, close bracket and enter, then we will get the complete name. But if I select that column, take out one of those M's and press enter, now we have the shortened name and that's what I want. We could, if we wanted, create two columns, one with the short version and one with the long version. But that will do for now, it's new column. So now we want the day. So I'm going to call it day. And it's simply the day function based on that same table we keep using and same column we keep using. So that's the day of the month, like the first and the second. What we now want to do though, is find the day of the week. And we're going to find the number first of all. So new column, and I'm going to call this one weekday number. And we're going to use a function called weekday. Now the really good thing is that some of the functions we've been using here, like year and month and now weekday, actually exist in Excel as well. So for those of you who may have used these before in your familiarity with Excel, then that certainly helps you pick up that you already know some DAX functions. At the same time, don't worry if you haven't used those or you're not a big Excel user because we're all learning DAX at the same time here. So it's weekday. Now the date, I think we know what that is. But then when I put in a comma, it will prompt me for what numbering system I want to use. Would I like to use a numbering system that begins from Sunday? Sunday is one and Saturday is seven. Well, maybe, but if I move to the next one down, that works with Monday being one and Sunday being seven. And that's what I would prefer to use. So I'm going to select that and that's the second option. So it puts the index of two in there. Close bracket and press enter. Brings us the weekday number. So the 1st of January 2016 was a Friday, because the 5th is a Friday. Okay, new column. Next up, we want the weekday name, just like we did with the month. So Friday, Saturday, and I want the shortened version again. So let's call this one weekday name. And the formula will be format on the date column and the format is going to be three D's. Don't forget to use your double quotes around it. So just like we did with a month, that's going to bring back those shortened versions of a weekday name. Now for one final column in here, because we could go on adding quarters and financial quarters, and concatenating months and years, and lots of other stuff that you do sometimes see people use. They may even have time datas put in here. For us though, I wanted my final calculated column to be an if function, a very popular function. And aside from what we've just been writing, one of the more common uses of a calculated column. Calculated columns are nowhere near as commonly used as the measures we see in the next module. Normally when somebody mentions DAX, they're talking about a measure. But at the moment we are building this table out, so these are calculated columns. So one more column. This one is going to be whether it's a weekday or a weekend. So I want to use the if function to test that if the weekday number is greater than five, then it's a weekend. I'm using Saturday and Sunday as my weekend dates, which is six and seven numerically. So the column's going to be called is weekend. And I'm just going to display a yes or a no. So if function, the logical test is if in the dates table, remember to reference the table, let me move down here 
what I want weekday number is greater than five, comma, display the word yes, comma, display the word no if it is not, the result if false, close off that bracket. And pressing enter, now we have a final column is weekend where Saturdays and Sundays have a yes and the Monday to Fridays have a no. And this is our dates table, which has got a few more things to iron out over the next few lessons and we're good to go to write our measures. In this lesson, we need to solve a problem that we have with the way that our month name and weekday name fields are being sorted. Now let me show you what I mean. If I switch to report view, and if I insert a visual, such as a table, and then over in the fields list, if I use the month name in the values area, then you can see that they're not sorted in the correct order. They are sorted in A to Z order, so April's first, followed by August, followed by December. That's not the order months should be in. But Power BI doesn't know that. Software such as Excel knows that because they have a built-in custom list. Power BI does not have that, but we will solve it. Just to demonstrate, if I remove the month name column by clicking the X, and I bring in the weekday name column instead, then we have the same issue. It starts from Friday, followed by Monday, followed by Saturday. So they're in A to Z order and not in the order that weekday names go. So let's switch back to data view. And I'll begin by selecting the month name column. Let's sort that one first. And up on the ribbon, go to column tools. In here, there's a button called sort by column. And I can select from the list the column to order it by. And this is where we want month number. I can say that those words should be ordered by those index numbers in month number. I can now do the same to the weekday name. If I select weekday name, sort by column, weekday number, and that's why I've used those numeric fields. I could use them in a report, but I'm more likely going to use a word such as March or Sunday. But I've included those numbers in the dates table to drive the order of those names. Now with a switch back to report view, I can see that those weekday names are in order. And if I go and remove weekday name from that visual and add in the month name, then they are also in the correct order. With our date table now set up and working, we need to tell Power BI to use it. And we do that by marking it as a date table. I'm in the report view at the moment. So if I click on data view on the left, make sure that I'm on the dates table, which I am. And in the ribbon, the table tools tab, where we can see the button to mark as date table. If I click on that button and choose to mark this table as the date table, a window will appear prompting me for the column that contains the dates. So from that drop down list provided, I will select the only date column that's in this table, which is date. That is validated successfully. And now I can click OK. And that is done. Now that we have our model set up, in this lesson, we are going to hide some of the table fields. At the moment, if we look over to the fields pane on the right, and I expand some of the tables, such as sales, 
and products. They contain all of their fields. But not all of these fields are going to be used in our reporting. A lot of those fields are ID fields that were necessary to create those relationships, but I may not be using them in my visuals. So they can be hidden just to declutter that field list and make our lives a little bit easier, which I think everybody appreciates. Now this is easiest done in the model view. So if I switch to model view, so that we can see all the tables already expanded, and we can also select multiple fields at the same time in here. So let's look through our tables. Starting with country, we have the country name and the country code. I think both of those are useful and could be used in reports. But then we have the country code field again in location. And that's important because it's establishing a relationship. But I don't need two country codes. I'm also not interested in the location ID. The location is sufficient here. The ID was just an index that we created in an earlier lesson. So if I click on country code, hold control, select location ID, and I'm going to hide those from the report view. So we're just doing some final tidying up here. We then have the products table, category product and the ID. Once again, I don't need that ID. Let's hide that from the report view. And you can see they have this little icon of an I crossed out to indicate that they're hidden. Then we have our sales table here. Now, a lot of that information can go. I don't need the date or the location ID or the product ID. Indeed, I don't even need the amount. So I'm going to select each of those fields. I'm going to keep the order ID. There's a possibility that an order ID could be used within some kind of visual. But the rest of them I'm going to hide. We don't need the amount field because in the next module, we're going to create some measures with all of our calculations. And I'll still be able to reference the amount field. It just won't appear on the right to be used within any tables or any charts. You can always come back here at any time and unhide these fields if it's a mistake at this point. Now, something else we may notice being in here is that our dates table is not connected to any of the other tables. So let me drag it into play a little bit more. And I'm going to click and drag from the date field in sales up to the date field in dates to create that relationship between the two tables. Remember, you can hover your mouse over the relationship line, just clarifying that the two date fields have been used. Within the dates table, I'm going to hide the weekday number and the month number fields. They were important. They enabled us to sort the month name, weekday names in an earlier lessons, but I have no plans to use them in any kind of visual. So our relationships are set up. We've decluttered it by hiding certain fields. So if I was to switch over to the report view, which is where we generally spend our time when we're creating our reports, and over in the field list on the right, if I was to expand the sales table, there is only one field in there, order ID. And if I expanded the dates table, there is no weekday number or month number. So we can still see them in other views, like the model view, but we can't see them in a report view, just giving us a cleaner working area. Hello and welcome to the practice exercise for the data modeling module. Go ahead and open file 3-7 practice exercise and follow the instructions provided. There is a completed version 
of this Power BI file named 3-7 practice exercise complete for you to check your work against. Have fun. So the first thing we need to do here is we need to get ourselves some data. Otherwise, we can't do any formulas or any visualizations. And the first data that we're going to import into Power BI are those four transactional sales files that we have stored in a folder. Now I'm going to go reasonably quickly through this section because a lot of this was covered in that beginner's course. So this really serves as a nice recap to ease you into this session. And also, if you haven't done the beginner's course, then you're going to understand how importing and transforming works as well. So hopefully everyone is a winner. So let's go to the Home tab and we're going to choose Get Data. Now, because I have these files in a folder, I can import the entire folder. So I can't see folder in this list of common data sources. So I'm going to select more at the bottom. And this opens up the Get Data pane. And you can see just how many sources we have. You can literally import data from so many different systems and applications. Now, for us, we have our stored very simply in a folder. I can see folder just here. So let's select and click Connect at the bottom. Now, this is going to open up a little window that is going to ask me to provide the folder path. So I basically just have to navigate to it by pressing the Browse button. Now I can make this window a little bit bigger. So now I just need to navigate to where I have these files stored. So there we go. There is my folder. It's called sales data. I'm going to select it. Now, remember, this will be different for you depending on where you've downloaded those files to. You might have them in a folder on your desktop. If so, navigate to there. Select the folder and click on OK and then click on OK again. So what you're going to see now is a window pop up, which is basically going to list out all of the files contained within that folder. And I can see there I have my sales files 2016 to 2019. I can see their CSVs. All looks good. So what is the next step from here? Well, we have some action buttons down the bottom. I could choose to combine these files, load them directly into Power BI, or I could transform the data first. Now, a good habit to get into is always going into transform data because this is going to open up Power Query where you can then make changes to these files before you import them into Power BI. And you can also make all different kinds of transformations. If you need to add columns or clean up the data, remove things, you can do it from here. So it's always good to click transform data when you're importing. Notice that I am now in the Power Query Editor. So this is another part of Power BI. And Power Query, as I said, essentially allows you to tidy up and clean your data so it's in a really nice state before you load it into Power BI. And cleaning data is so important when we're going to analyze it because we don't want things like blank rows or incorrect formatting in our data because it's going to give us inaccurate analysis results. Now, the four files that you can see in Power Query at the moment are the only four files that I had in my sales data folder. However, if you've got files that you want to use contained within a folder and that folder also contains other files that you don't necessarily want to import, if you see these files listed here because you've chosen to import everything in the folder, you can filter those files out simply by clicking the extension drop down. And for example, if you had some PDFs or Excel files in here, they would all be listed and you can simply uncheck the box and then those won't be analyzed in Power Query or imported into Power BI. So that's a good little tip. So get yourself to this stage. In the next lesson, I'm going to show you how we can combine all of these files into one file because these are essentially the same. They all have the same layout as in the same column headings. They just contain different data. So we're going to put these in one big file and call it sales. So get yourself to this stage and then I'll see you in the next lesson. So in the last lesson, we imported our four sales files and we're now going to transform them in Power Query.
And I mentioned that because these files are all effectively the same with the same columns, we're going to combine all of them together into one big file so that we don't have four separate files to import. Now, combining files in Power Query is very simple. Take a look at the first column titled Content. Notice that we have these two arrows, this little icon. And as I hover my mouse over those arrows, it says Combine Files. So to combine all of these together, all we need to do is click on this button. The Combine Files window will open and it's going to show you a preview based on the first 200 rows of that first file. So I'm looking at all of the data, the first 200 rows of the 2016 sales data file. And this is really just to give you an idea as to what that data is going to look like. And of course, if you want to view the first 200 rows of any of these files, if you click the drop down just here, you can switch to any of the sales files to get a preview of what the first 200 rows will look like. Now I'm happy with this, so let's click on OK to combine those together. So it's now combined those files together and I'm looking at that combined data file. Take a look on the left hand side, you can see I have my queries pane just here. And most of these queries have been generated for me by Power Query. The only one that I'm interested in is the one that I'm currently working on, which is sales data just here. And it's named this query based on the folder name that I imported the files from. And we're going to rename this query in a moment to something a bit more meaningful. Notice over on the right hand side, this is where we have the properties. So this is in fact where we can rename this query if we need to. And then underneath we have our applied steps and applied steps basically tracks everything that you're doing in Power Query. And this is a really useful little pane because if you make a change to your data in Power Query and you want to undo that or backtrack to the file in an earlier state, you can simply click on the cross in the Applied Steps pane to backtrack through the changes that you've made. So now that we have our data in one big long file in Power Query, let's start to tidy it up before we import it into Power BI. Now, one of the main things you want to make sure that you're doing when you're dealing with large files like this is you really want to make your data as efficient as possible so that it's fast to load and also fast to interrogate with things like formulas. So you really want to take the time to go through your data, removing any columns which aren't going to be needed in the final analysis and generally tidying things up. So that's what we're going to do over the next few lessons. But let's just remove any columns from this data that we're not going to need. Now, as I scroll across, I am going to need pretty much all of these columns in my final analysis. However, the first column here where it says source name, this is just showing me the file name. Now, I don't really need that anymore because we've combined these into one big file. I already have a date column here, which is showing me the year as well. So I'm going to get rid of this source name column simple process, right click on the column and select remove. Notice that when I've done that, now in the applied steps pane, the last action I took is to remove columns. If I decided that I wanted that column back again, I could click the cross and it reappears. So just be aware of that. Now looking at this data, I can see that there are some other changes that I'm going to need to make. For example, if we look at the product column just here, what I have in here is the product. So if we take this first line as an example, chicken fajita wrap, but then after that in brackets, we have basically the location of the store. Now this isn't the ideal way to have this data. I'm really going to want to break this up. So that's exactly what we're going to do in the next lesson. I'm going to show you some techniques you can use when you have to split data across columns and also how you can merge data from multiple columns into one. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at how we can split and merge column data. And I introduced the example that we're going to use in the last lesson. And that is we need to make some changes to this product column because currently we have both the product and the location listed in this column. Now, why is that a problem? Well, really, it's just going to make your data a lot more difficult to analyze. 
For example, if I wanted to analyze this data by location, maybe I was interested in seeing the total profit by location, that's going to be quite difficult for me to do if I have the location combined with the product in one cell. It's going to be hard for me to interrogate. It's much better to have separate pieces of information in separate columns. So really, we want the product in one column and the location in another. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a couple of techniques in Power Query to break up this column into two separate columns. First thing you need to do, select the column that you want to split up. From the Home tab in the Transform group, we have a split column option. And we have a number of different ways that we can split this data. Now, which one you choose really depends on the kind of data that you have in your column. Now, I can see here that my product and my location are separated with a space. So I want to separate this by that space in the middle. And we call things like spaces, dashes, tabs. Those are referred to as delimiters. So I'm going to split mine by delimiter. So what I can now do is go in and select the delimiter that I want to use. So, for example, if I had the product and the location separated with a comma, I could choose a comma or a colon or a space or a tab. Now I'm going to choose custom and define where I want to split them myself. So I want to split where we have a space and then an open bracket. And I want to split at each occurrence of this delimiter because I can see that I only have one occurrence of this delimiter in each item. Let's click on OK and let the magic happen. So take a look at our data now. We have two columns, product one and currently product two. I have my products in one column. I have my locations in another, but notice that I still have that closing bracket. So I'm going to need to get rid of that as well. Now we can get rid of this using a simple replace. So let's click this column again up to the transform group and into replace values. So this is very much like your regular standard find and replace. I just need to determine what my value to find is and what I want to replace it with. So I want Power BI to find in this column the closing bracket and I want to replace it with nothing. So I'm going to leave this box blank. Click on OK and like magic, I've got rid of those closing brackets. So very straightforward. Now what I want to do is just rename these column headings so that they make more sense. So we can double click in the heading and I'm going to change this to location and hit enter. And let's double click in this heading. And I just want this to be called product, not product one. And there we go. Very quickly, we've managed to break up that data. Now, what if I wanted to do the reverse of this? Maybe I have information contained within two separate columns that I want to merge together. Well, again, this is very simple. We can select both of the columns, go to the transform tab. And in the middle here, we have a merge columns option. So the first thing I need to do here is define how I want to separate these columns. So what is my separator going to be? So if I wanted a comma or a colon or a space, I could choose it from here. I could even add again my own custom delimiter. So let's go for that and say that I want these split up with a space dash space. I can then choose what I want my new column name to be called. So let's just say product and location as the name. Click on OK. And now take a look at what I have. I have a new column and I have my product and my location separated with a dash. So super simple to split and merge columns. Now, I don't want these columns merged. I actually do want them split. So what I can do is go across to my applied steps and just backtrack until I get back to those two separate columns. So let's click the cross and that's going to unmerge those columns. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the course. In this lesson, we're going to explore in a bit more detail relationships between tables. And this really all falls under the data modeling heading. And when we're talking about data modeling, we really just mean how our tables relate to each other. And if you remember, in the last section, we created some unique columns, product ID, location ID, and then I've got my country ID all the way over on the end here to uniquely identify 
items in each row and also to keep the data set small to interrogate. So let's now take a closer look at relationships between tables and I'm going to show you some of the problems that can occur. Now before we get on to doing that, I can see something that I need to change. If I look in this date column, I can see that my dates have changed format. These were all in short date. And the reason why they've changed format is because of the last demonstration I was doing with regards to conflicts between UK and US format. So I'm quickly going to deal with that because it's very straightforward to do in Power BI. So instead of this format, I would like the short date format. So if we go up to the formatting area and click the formatting drop down, all I need to do here is select short date and it's going to change all those back to how they were. So now that we've done that, let's jump across to our model view and take a look at our relationships. Now, because we've added in some more columns since our last refresh, we added in all of those ID columns. You can see that the model has automatically been updated because I have auto detect relationships set. Power BI will do its best to map fields of the same name between tables. So for example, if I hover over this relationship, I can see it's mapped country ID in the countries table to country ID in the sales table. It's also mapped product ID in the products table to, and if I scroll down, I should be able to see this, product ID in the sales table. And notice that I also have another relationship here that links the country code in the countries table to the country code in the locations table. Now notice in the middle, I have a line that doesn't look like the others. And that is this line just here. Now take a look when I hover over it, this is actually linking or creating a relationship between the location ID in the locations table and the date field in the sales table. So something isn't quite right there. And the reason that we have a dotted line here is because this relationship is inactive. So solid line means that the relationship is active, dotted line is inactive. If I double click on this line to take me into the edit relationship dialog box, I can see the relationship set up here. But if I take a look at the bottom where it says make this relationship active, that box isn't checked. And that's because there is a bit of an anomaly here because it's linked date to the location ID. Now this is a simple fix. All we would need to do is map the correct field. So I can just select location ID and map that to location ID in locations. And then I can say, make this relationship active. But take a look at what I get. I get a warning message at the bottom that says, you can't create a direct active relationship between sales and locations because that would introduce ambiguity between tables, countries and sales. To make this relationship active, deactivate or delete one of the relationships between countries and sales first. So what does that all mean? Well, let's click on cancel. So basically what this means is that we have too many relationships that are in conflict with each other. So currently the locations table location ID column is trying to link to the location ID in the sales field. But what do we also have related to this locations table? We have another relationship from the countries table that is linked via the country code. So if we take a look at the countries table, what we have here is the country code, the country and the country ID. Now I added a country ID column in here, but the country codes are also unique values. So effectively I could use either of these columns to link to other tables. I have a country code link between countries and locations, and then I'm trying to use a location ID link between locations and sales. And if we take a look at the locations table, you can see that I also have the country code listed here. So we basically have too many pieces of conflicting information going on. So what I'm going to do is with this connection here between the countries table and the locations table, I'm going to delete out this relationship because really you want your lookup tables all linking through to your fact table. And the fact table knows what the country code is because it's linked to the location ID in the locations table. So what I'm going to do here is right click and delete out this relationship. So now I just have my three lookup tables and all of them are linked to my main fact table. Now that I've done that, I can make this relationship active. So let's double click 
I'm going to select make this relationship active. Notice that I'm no longer getting that warning message and click on OK. And I now have a solid line link. So basically that additional relationship that was linking country code in countries to country code in locations was unnecessary. And it was proving to be a bit of a conflict for Power BI because the sales table already knows how to pull that country code information because it's linked by the location ID. So just be aware of things like that because they can arise when you're creating relationships. So just be very aware of things like that when you're working in Power BI. It's always good to switch across to this model view and make sure that all of your relationships are working correctly. And if you find one that's causing a few problems, jump in there and fix it straight away. It's now time to talk about the different types of relationships that can be set up in Power BI. So currently we have our fact table, our sales table, and then we have relationships with the three dimension tables. And what you'll notice is that these lines that connect the fact table with the dimension tables have either a one or an asterisk at either end. So what exactly does this mean? Well, it's basically telling me what the relationship type is between these two tables. And this is what we refer to in Power BI as cardinality. So let's take a look at this relationship we have between the countries table and the sales table. So these two are linked by that country ID field. Now I can see that I have a one next to the countries table and an asterisk next to the sales table. And if we double click to open up the edit relationships dialog box, at the bottom here, I can see the cardinality I have set. So this is a many to one relationship. And you can see in brackets afterwards, it says asterisk to one. So if we take a look at that, I have an asterisk on the sales table and a one by the countries table. So the asterisk represents many and the one represents one. So between sales and countries, we have a many to one relationship. Now, if you feel like this reads a bit backwards because it's more logical to say that, oh, OK, this is a one to many relationship, then you might want to reorganize the way that you're looking at your tables just to make this a little bit clearer to understand. So if I put the sales table at the top here and have all of my dimension tables underneath, that's a bit easier to understand. Now it kind of reads many to one. So what exactly does that mean? Well, in general, where you have the number one, that means that in the countries table, there is only one instance of the country ID. So if you're a member in the countries table, if we jump across and take a look at it, we set this up so that we don't have any duplicate country codes or country IDs in here. So there's only ever going to be one. Whereas when we jump across to the sales table, because it's going to use that country code column to look up the information, there could be many orders per country ID. And that is where that many to one relationship comes in. One unique value that could relate to many different orders. So that is the many to one relationship. And it's by far the most common one that you'll come across. Now, if we double click to go back into edit this relationship again, we can click this drop down and see the other relationship types that we have here. We have one to one, one to many and many to many. And the cool thing about Power BI is that if I was to try and change this relationship from many to one to one to many, it's going to tell me that the cardinality you've selected isn't valid for this relationship. So that's really good because it kind of stops me from making a mistake. It's just not going to do it. So I need to switch this back to many to one. Now, if I click the drop down, we currently have many to one selected, but we also have one to many down here. Now, if I choose this, it's telling me that this isn't valid for my data. Now, for some data sets, this will be valid because basically many to one and one to many aren't really all that different from each other. It just depends on which way you're reading the tables. For example, I could read this as one to many, or I could read this as many to one. So it's essentially the same thing, but I have a many to one relationship here because for the type of data that I'm using, one to many isn't valid. For example, there can't be multiple countries for one order ID. 
Each customer, when they order a product, they get their own unique individual order ID, and that customer is going to be located in one country. You wouldn't have the same order ID for customers located in other countries. Hence why we can't create a one-to-many relationship here. But for some data, one-to-many is a relationship that is available to you and you'll be able to select it from here without getting this validity message. Now we have a couple of other relationship types in here. We have one-to-one and many-to-many. And I'm going to insert a screenshot just to illustrate one-to-one -one because I don't have any of those in my data. So a one-to-one -one relationship would be created if both of the fields on either side are unique. And a many-to-many -many relationship occurs when multiple records in a table are associated with multiple records in another table. And I would say that one-to-one -one and many-to-many are the relationships that you're least likely to come across when you're working in Power BI. But they are there in case you have a scenario that needs them. Most of the time when you're creating relationships as we are here between a fact table and dimensions table, you're either going to see that many to one or one to many relationship. The final thing I'd like to talk to you about in this section related to relationships is the cross filter direction. Now, another thing that you might have noticed when you're looking at your tables in model view is that each of these lines where we have our relationships set up have an arrow in the middle. And you can see that I have an arrow on all of these lines. So what exactly is this arrow? Well, if we double click on one of these lines to open up the edit relationship box, that little arrow relates to this section just here, the cross filter direction. And we have two options in here, single and both. So if you see just one arrow, then the cross filter direction that you have applied is single. If you set the cross filter direction to both, then you'll see two arrows pointing each way in here. So what is the difference between these two? Well, the cross filter direction really relates to the way that you filter your data. So for example, I have the countries table linked with the sales table and I have a single cross filter direction. So what that's basically telling me is that currently I can filter on the fields in the countries table to produce a result in the sales table. And that would make a lot of sense. Most of the time when it comes to your sales data, you use other parameters to filter. So for example, I might want to find out how many orders we've had for a particular country. So I could select the country code and it will filter in one direction the number of orders. However, what about if I wanted to do this in the reverse? So maybe I wanted to be able to select the order ID and have it tell me which country submitted that order. Well, currently I wouldn't be able to do that because I only have my filter set to single. So the filter can only filter one way. So let's look at an example of this. Now I'm going to jump across to my visualizations area and I've actually added in a couple of visualizations and these are just two tables. This one's a matrix table and this one is just a regular table. And in this matrix table, I'm basically displaying all of the locations, the categories across the top, and then we have the sales quantity listed below and the totals. And then in the other table, I simply have a list of all of the countries. Now, remember, I have my cross filter direction going from the country table to the sales table in one direction. So that means I can click on something in this country table and this sales table is going to update. So if I click on Austria, the table will update and only show me the locations within Austria. If I click on Canada, the same thing's going to happen. If I click on New Zealand, or maybe if I hold down my control key and also select Norway, I'm going to see those results. So I can see that my cross filter direction when it's set to single is working if I want to filter from countries to sales. But what about if I want to filter in the other direction? Maybe I want to be able to select a location in the matrix table and see the country that that location is located in. So if I select Copenhagen, 
Notice that this country table doesn't update because I can't filter in both directions. So now if we go back to our relationships, if I double click on this line, what I could do is change the cross filter direction to both, click on OK. And after a couple of seconds, you'll notice that I now have two arrows as opposed to one. And if I go back to my visualizations, if I now select something like Berlin, you can see that that is now filtering and letting me know that Berlin is in Germany. So those are the two options you have when it comes to cross filtering. Now, it's also important to note that when you create your relationships, if you have a many to one or a one to many relationship, which is the most common cardinality you're going to come across, the cross filter direction is automatically set to single. So if you find that you do need to filter in both directions, make sure that you change this to both and then you shouldn't have any problems. In this section of the course, we're going to explore visualizations because really this is what Power BI is all about. And the way I like to look at this is I kind of split Power BI into three sections in my mind. We import and clean our data. We extract meaning from our data using DAX calculations and measures. And then we present that data using visualizations. And the idea behind visualizations is giving your customers, clients, managers, whoever you're presenting this data to, insight into the data, which in turn is going to help them make better business decisions. So currently, if we were to look at our table data, and this is the sales table, it's pretty difficult for us to analyze this data in its current state. I can't easily see things like which products have sold the most or which products are selling the best in different countries. It would be much better if I could create a chart or some kind of visualization that easily shows these metrics. And this is a really important point here. Before you even begin to build visualizations, it's worth taking a look at your data and working out exactly what's going to be of interest to your audience. What information are they interested in? What do they need to know? What metrics are important to them? And once you have all of that information, it's going to be a lot easier for you to decide what type of visualization you want to use to display which metric. So in this first lesson, I really just want to give you an introduction into visualizations so you understand what you're looking at. And then over the next few lessons, we'll run through some of the most popular so you can kind of get a feel as to how they work. So in order to build up your visualizations, you need to make sure that you are in report view. And you'll notice that I currently have one visualization on this page, and it's a very simple table visualization that's just showing the countries and the total profit. And we have the grand total at the bottom. So a very straightforward table with any of these visualizations. Once you add them, click on them to select, and then you can do things like resizing them to fit them into specific spaces, or you can just pick them up and drag and drop them to reposition. And there are lots of different types of visualizations that you can add to your page. And you'll see the entire gallery of them over on the right hand side in the visualizations area. And we have dipped in and out of here throughout the course. And now it's really time to focus our attention on these icons. Now, notice all the different types that we have. When we hover over, we can see exactly what that visualization is. And some of these should look pretty familiar to you if you're used to using charts in Excel. So we have things like stacked bar charts, stacked column charts, clustered bar charts, clustered column charts, area charts, waterfall charts, funnel charts, even things like pie and donut charts. You have access to map charts and field map charts as well. And a really cool feature is this little gauge. And I'll show you how that works a bit later on. We have card visualizations, which we can add to our page, as well as tables and matrix tables. And these all work in a very similar way with regards to how you add them onto your page. So if we just delete out this table that we have, I'm just going to select it and press the delete key on my keyboard. Let me give you an example of how you add a visualization and then add data. So let's do that table again. I'm going to go to my visualizations pane. And I'm just going to click on table. You can see that it just adds a blank table and it says select or drag fields to populate this visual. So once you have a visual added, even if it's blank, 
If you go across to just underneath where we have our visualizations, notice we have three icons just here, fields, format, and then analytics. Now fields is where you populate the information for the table. And you can see here we have a values area and it says add data fields here. So if I want to display the countries in the rows, what I would do is go over to my different tables of data. I'm going to find my countries table. I'm going to grab the country field. And I'm going to drag and drop it to this values area. So this is quite similar to Excel pivot tables. Now you can see I have all of the countries listed out and I can then add in my metric. So maybe I'm interested in seeing the total cost or the average price or maybe the total profit for each country. Whatever it is that I'm interested in, I just need to grab the correct field and that can be one from your table or it might be a measure that you've created. I'm going to go for total profit and you can either drag it up to that values area and place it underneath country or if I just click the cross to get rid of it, you can drag it directly onto the visualization. And that is basically how all of these visualizations are structured. Now, you won't necessarily just see values for all of these visualizations. For example, when you're adding things like charts, you might have a few different fields that you need to complete for X axis, Y axis, legend, and drag and drop the fields that you want to show. But in general, you'll always find the fields under the fields list just here. Once you have your data in the visualization, you're then probably going to want to format it, maybe make it look a little bit nicer or match your brand colors. And that is where we would switch across to the format area. Now we'll say you have to make sure that you have the visualization selected first, click on the formatting button, and this opens up a whole load of different ways that we can format this particular table. And you can literally expand these and customize everything on this visualization. And we're going to get familiar with each of these and the kinds of things they do as we go through this section. Now, one important thing to note here, which I find is super useful because there are so many different options in here. Sometimes you find yourself scrolling up and down, expanding different categories, desperately searching for whatever it is that you're looking for. So something I find really useful is this search bar at the top if I'm looking for something specific. Maybe I want to align these column headings in this table to the center. So instead of expanding all of these, trying to find that option, I can click in search, type in alignment, and it's going to pull back everything from all of those categories related to alignment. And I find this a lot easier because I can see here immediately column headings. OK, this is the alignment that deals with these column headings. If I scroll down, maybe I want to align the actual fields. I've got my options there for that. Or maybe I want to align the title. So basically all of my alignment options are together because I've searched for them. So I can come into column headings. I can say I want them aligned to the center and you can now see that those have shifted across. Now I actually don't want them in the center. So let's put that back to auto, which is going to push them to the left. But just be aware of that. If I double click and type in format, it's going to pull back all of the options that I have for formatting. So using that search can sometimes make it a lot quicker when you're looking for specific items within your visualization to format. Now, the final thing I want you to note here before we jump into creating our own visualizations and formatting them is if you're not clicked on a visualization and you're just clicked on that page background, when you go to your visualizations pane and the format area, Notice what we have in here. We now have our options for formatting the page as opposed to the visualization. So for example, if I wanted to change the background of this page, I would need to go into wallpaper. And this is a little bit misleading because we do have a page background section just here, but the actual page color is controlled underneath wallpaper. I could change that to something like blue to set that page. So the main point I'm trying to make here is that if you want to format the visualization, make sure that you're clicked on it. If you're not, it's going to be that page background that you're actually changing. So let's start out by talking about a really popular visualization, and that is the matrix table. Now, currently on this page, I have just a table. 
and you'll see that there are two icons in the visualizations pane. This one just here is for the table and this one next to it is for the matrix table. So what is the difference between these two visualizations? Well, the main difference is that the table is kind of a flat structure and it can display one dimension of data. For example, currently we are showing the country and then the total profit for each country. I could grab a, another field. So let's go for let's go for total cost, drag and drop that into the values area. And that's going to give me another column that shows the total cost by country. And I could carry on going, adding different columns. But each time I'm just summarizing these totals by the country. If I wanted to add in a second dimension, so maybe I wanted to summarize the total profit and total cost by country and also by year, I would need to create a matrix table. And a matrix table is kind of similar to an Excel pivot table. So let's click on matrix and I'm going to drag this up next to my table. So now what I can do here is add a second dimension in. And notice now that I'm clicked on the matrix table, if we take a look at our fields, I have rows, columns and values. So I need to drag in at least three fields to create this matrix table. So what do I want displayed in my rows? Well, maybe this is where I want the countries. So I'm going to go to my countries table, which is up here, grab the country and place that in rows. And there we go. What do I now want in my columns? Well, maybe I want to see the years. So I'm going to go down to my dates table, grab that year field and place that in columns. And now I can see 2016 to 2019. All that's left is my values in the middle. So what am I interested in here? Well, I'm interested in seeing the total profit by country across these years. So I'm going to grab the total profit field and remember you can drag it into values or you can just drop it straight on to the table. I can drag that out to resize and I can see that I now have the data summarized in a way that's a little bit more meaningful. So that is the difference between a table and a matrix table. A matrix table has two dimensions as opposed to one. Another cool thing about matrix tables is the ability to drill down through information. So I'm going to reorder my matrix table and we're going to display some different information in here. So currently I have my country in rows. I'm going to get rid of that. So let's click on the cross to remove that. I'm also going to remove years, but I'm going to keep total profit in here. And this time I want to summarize by category. So let's drop that into rows, but also by product. So I'm going to grab product and drop that underneath category in that rows area. And then for the columns, let's do let's do year again. So let's scroll up, grab year and drop that into columns. Now notice the difference here. Can you see next to each of the categories, I now have this little plus symbol. So that is letting me know that there's more information hidden underneath here. And again, this works very similar to Excel pivot tables. If you take a look at my values, you can see I have category and then I'm summarizing by product. So if I click the plus next to beverages, it's going to open up all of the products that belong to the beverages category, and then I can see the related information. Notice also just above, I have four icons here, which are going to help me when it comes to drilling down through my different categories. Now, currently I have these plus and minus symbols turned on. So it's reasonably straightforward for people to understand what these are. Most people know that if you click on a plus, it's going to expand something out. But what about if I want people to be able to double click in order to expand these? Currently, if I double click on beverages, nothing happens. But what I could do is turn on the ability to drill down. So let's click this icon. It's going to turn black. And that means that if I now double click on beverages, it's going to expand that group. If I click on drill up, that's going to collapse up that category. Now, this is particularly useful if you don't have these plus and minus symbols turned on. And this is something you'll find under the format area for this specific type of table. 
And this would probably be where I would use this search bar at the top because I don't want to have to go through every single category looking for the one little toggle that's going to turn off these plus icons. So in search, I'm just going to put a plus in there. Look what it finds, plus minus icons on or off. If I click this slider to turn them off, they now disappear. So the way I can now drill down through these items is simply by double clicking on the category and it's going to expand that out. So this is particularly useful if you don't have those plus and minus icons turned on. Now I'm going to have those turned on because they don't take up a great deal of room and I just like to make it super obvious for people. The next icon is if I have multiple levels to my hierarchy, this is going to take me to the next one. And the final icon here is going to expand all of these categories down one level in the hierarchy. So if I want a quick way to be able to expand all of these, I can click on this icon and it's going to expand everything out and I can then resize my table. So don't forget about these little buttons at the top when it comes to organizing these different categories of hierarchical information. Let's take a look at some of the other formatting options that we have underneath here. And there are so many of them, I'm not going to go through all of them, but let's take a look at some of the main points. So if we expand general, this is where you can come to define the position of your table. For example, the exact width and the exact height of this table. And this is sometimes useful to define if you need to fit your table into an exact space, you can ensure it's always that size. And if the data breaches that width, for example, you're going to get scroll bars come up on your table. So much like I have a scroll bar just here for my data set. So let's collapse general back up again. The next one down is style. And currently you can see that the style I have applied is just the default style. But we have a few different choices in here. For example, minimal, that basically turns off those banded rows and adds a little bit of cell padding. So essentially we have a little bit more room for each of these numbers. And I would say that minimal is probably the one I use most often. I think it's quite a nice clean look and it doesn't distract away from the data. Some of these, as you'll see, are a little bit crazy. So we've got one there, bold header, quite difficult to see. Alternating rows, so that's adding in your banded rows there. We've got flashy rows, which is a blue color. And remember, these colors can be customized. You're just really selecting your base template for the style. So go through these and see which one you like. I'm going to stick with minimal. The next thing we have is the grid. So this basically relates to the grid lines that you can see in this table. You can choose to have the vertical grid off or on. So currently mine is off. If I turn that on, you're going to see I now get vertical lines and I actually quite like that. I can choose my vertical grid color. So if I want these to be blue, for example, I can have those blue lines running down. I can change the grid thickness. So if I want them a bit wider, I can adjust that just there. And I've got basically the same options for the horizontal grid. So if I want to change that to the same blue color, I could do that as well. We've also got things like the outline color and the outline weight. So go through some of these options, have a little play around and see what you like. We have a column headers section. So again, this is where we can come to change things like the font color for our headings. And just to show you what this looks like, let's do, let's do a purple color. You can see here now I have at the top here, my header labels have changed to purple. Now I don't like that. Let's do a darker blue just to keep in with the color scheme that we have going on. I can also change the background color. So if I want them to be maybe a light shaded gray, I could do that also. I can change the font family, the text size, how they're aligned, so on and so forth. So all of the options in there to customize the look and feel of those column headings. And of course, we have similar options for our row headers as well. So if I want to change the font color, background color, the outline, so on and so forth. Now this option here is something I would direct your attention to where we have stepped layout. So remember, we have a hierarchy system in this table. We have our category and then we have the products. And currently in the way that this is displaying, I have the category at the top here and then the products are underneath very slightly indented. 
But what about if I wanted these products in their own separate column? So this would be similar to tabular layout if you were using Excel pivot tables. Well, if I would like them in another column, I can turn off step layout. And as soon as I do that, take a look at what happens. They now have their own product column. So it might be that you prefer this format. If you do, turn off step layout. Now I feel this takes up a bit of unnecessary space, so I'm going to turn my step layout back on to organize them like that. We can then format our values. So now we're dealing with the actual values within this table. And again, all of the options that you would expect, we can change the color, the background color. We can customize our banded rows. Now, if you look at this, my banded rows are turned on, but because of the style that I've used, the minimal style, my minimal style doesn't include banded rows. So even though these are on, I'm not seeing them. So just be aware of that. We've then got subtotals. So with matrix tables, by default, your subtotals are going to show at the top. So I can see where we have categories. I can then see the subtotals for each of the years. Now, if you don't want subtotals on, you can simply toggle this slider off and they're going to disappear. You can even change the position of these subtotals. So again, I'm somebody who prefers to read my subtotals at the bottom of each group. That's just naturally how my eye goes. So if I scroll down a little bit, you can see that we have an option here for row subtotal position. Currently that's set to top. Let's change that to bottom and it's going to move those down. What we can also do is if we want to change the label, so currently mine just says total, I can change the row subtotals label here. So maybe I want to say something like uh, category total, and that makes it just a little bit easier to understand. We've got the same here for column subtotals, so I can turn those off and it's going to get rid of that column, or I can keep those turned on. So lots of different customizations in there as well. We've got similar options in here for grand totals. And then we have a field formatting section. And this is where I can choose the units that I want to display these totals in. So if I switch this to, let's say, thousands, you can see what that's going to look like. It changes all of those values. I could change it to millions and I get a more concise version of my totals. So if I was trying to save a little bit of space here, I could switch this to millions. Now I'm going to keep mine on none just to stick with my original formatting. Notice you can also adjust the decimal places in here. I can change the background color of my values if I want to. So maybe I want to do a light blue and that's going to shade all of those. And I can change things like the alignment. So if I want these center aligned, I can change that from here also. Now I'm going to switch this back to white to keep everything consistent and easy to read. In the last lesson, we were walking through how to format this matrix table. So let's pick up from where we left off. Conditional formatting, I'm going to skip over for the moment because we're going to do that in a later lesson. Let's jump to title. Now, currently, I don't have a title showing on this matrix table. So if I toggle it on, I can then add some title text. So what is this table representing? Well, it's total profit by year, oops, by year and category. And that's going to give me a nice little title for this table. I can choose the font color. So I'm going to change this to a dark blue. I can even choose the background color. So maybe I want this to stand out a little bit. Let's do a light blue color at the top there. And I can change my alignment, my text size, and even my font family. So let's give this, let's change this to Cambria. I then have some options to change the background of the table. So I can choose a color and I can set the transparency of that color. So if I had something like purple in the background, I can then drag this transparency slider so that that isn't as intense. Now, I don't particularly like that. I think it looks a little bit amateurish and I like to keep things as clean as possible. So let's go back to white. I can lock the aspect ratio. So if I turn this on, it means that if I was to resize this table, it's going to resize this table evenly. I have some options for the border. So if I want a border around my table, I can turn that on. And then, of course, I can choose the color 
and how many pixels I want that border to be. I can even have a shadow on my table if I want to. I'm not going to bother with that. And then finally, at the bottom here, we have tool tips. Now, I currently have this turned off. We're going to talk more about tool tips in a later lesson because these can be super useful. So for now, we're going to skip over that. And then finally, we have visual header. And this relates to these icons running across the top. So you can even customize the look and feel of these. I can change the background color. I can change the border. I can even change the icon color. So if I wanted these to match the overall theme of my table, maybe I want to make them a dark blue color and those are going to change color. And I can choose which icons I want to show up here as well. So I don't necessarily have to have all of these showing. I can go through and use the slider to toggle them off or on. So that is a very quick run through of all of the customization options that you have regarding matrix tables. Now you've seen them in matrix tables, they take on a similar format for every single visualization. So have a good look through these, play around with them, find out what they do, and then you should be pretty much set when it comes to formatting for whichever visualization you add. One part of the formatting options that we kind of skipped over in the last lesson was conditional formatting. And that's because there is quite a bit to conditional formatting. So I wanted to dedicate an entire lesson to how you can apply it to your visualizations. So we're still formatting this matrix table. Let's jump down to conditional formatting and expand that out and see what we've got. Now, you might be more familiar with conditional formatting in an application like Excel. And if you are, then you're probably going to have no problems using it in Power BI because it is effectively the same thing. Now, if you're not familiar with conditional formatting, the main purpose of it is to help you highlight important data in your tables. So again, if I look at my data that I have here, remember I have my products summarized by the category that they belong to and also the year. And we're summarizing by total profit. So if I want to very quickly be able to pick out of this data the highest values and the lowest values, I could use conditional formatting to do that. And in Power BI, we have three types of conditional formatting we can apply. And again, if we relate this back to something like Excel, we can apply a color scale, we can apply data bars, or we can apply icon sets. So let's take a look at each of them so that you understand how they work. So we've expanded that conditional formatting format area, and we can see that we're applying our conditional formatting to the total profit. So basically all of the values that we have within this table. Now, conditional formatting won't include the totals by default. So you don't need to worry about that because totals can throw off the accuracy of your conditional formatting. So fortunately, it doesn't get applied to those totals. Now, the first little slider we have here is background color. And this is basically a bit of a strange name for color scales. Again, if you've used those in Excel, you'll know that they're kind of like a heat map. Now, if we turn this slider on, you'll notice that immediately the colors change in my matrix table because currently Power BI is just applying the default conditional formatting. So the thing I would do straight away is jump into advanced controls because this is where you can really customize what you're seeing in here. So the format that we're using is a color scale. We're applying it to only the values and it's based on our total profit. We're summarizing by the sum of the total profit and where it has default formatting as zero, what this basically means is that if you have a blank value in your data, the formatting will be applied as if there was a zero value in there. We can then choose how we want this formatting to apply. And you can see we have minimum and maximum. So it's going to highlight or shade the background of the lowest value in our data in this light blue color and the highest value in a dark blue color. And this is the default that's already been applied to my data. So if we just cancel out of here a second, you can see that these values in this dark blue color are the highest values. And then we kind of work our way down in shading towards the lighter blue and the lightest color blue is going to be our lowest values. So that's kind of how conditional formatting works. 
Also note that for the blank cells that we have here, those have been highlighted in the lightest blue color. So if we jump back into advanced controls, I can change the colors. So if, so if I don't want this to be light blue and dark blue, I can simply click the drop down and choose my own colors. Also by default, it's going to apply this color scale based on the lowest value that it finds in your data. And the same with this one, the highest value that it finds in the data. Now you could even in here change this and set your own custom values for the minimum and maximum. And the shading will be applied according to the values that you've set in here. So this is a way of customizing this conditional formatting to suit your needs. Now, most of the time you're going to want to choose lowest value and highest value to see where those values fall within that range. Now, if you click on diverging, that gives you a center value as well. And once again, this color can be customized and you could choose custom from in here also. So if we add in that middle value and click on OK, let's see what we get. So with that diverging middle value turned on, this is actually a little bit easier for me to read. So I can see quite clearly here where my lowest values are because they're all in light blue going through that color gradient up to my highest values, which are showing in the darker blue. And remember, you can always jump in here and change these colors if you're finding them a bit difficult to understand. So that is how you can use the background color, the color scale. If you want to get rid of it, we can simply toggle this slider off. Now you can do a similar thing, but this time using the font color as opposed to the background color. So if you would rather that the font for the values changes as opposed to the background color, you could toggle this on, go to your advanced controls and you have similar options just here. So I could set this to, and you're probably going to want to do slightly darker colors for this so that it shows up. Let's do a dark red and a dark green. So I'm going to go to more colors for this. Let's drag our slider down to the green and we'll go for quite a dark green. And let's click on OK. Now still, you see that is quite difficult to see. So you have to be careful with your colors here if you really want those values to stand out. And this is why in general, I prefer to use the background color because I just find it a little bit easier to read. But that option is there if you prefer it. The next thing you have here is data bars. So if we turn these on, these are little representations of the value within that cell. And you can choose to show these bars with the value displaying, or you can choose to show just the bar only. So let's jump into advanced controls for our data bars. And you can see right at the top, the first option is show bar only. So if I select that and click on OK, it's actually going to remove the values and just leave a representation of the values in the form of that bar. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, when on earth would that be useful? And the scenario that I tend to think of is if maybe you work in HR and you're presenting data that's quite sensitive, maybe it relates to employee salaries, you might want to give people a general idea of where that salary falls within a range without showing them the employee's actual salary. So when information is sensitive, sometimes this is a really good way of getting around that. Now we are going to show the values. So let's jump into advanced controls again and just take a tick out of that box. And the same principle applies here. Power BI is looking for the lowest value it finds in our range of data and also the highest value. And the length of the bar is defined by where the value in the cell falls within that range. And this is a really important point to note when it comes to data bars. People tend to think that this bar kind of represents almost like 100% but it doesn't. The bar is very much in relation to the lowest and highest numbers. So the highest value in this table, and I think that might possibly be this one at the top here, this one is essentially 100%. And everything else is kind of defined by that. So this one just here is kind of like a percentage of the highest value. Now you could get these data bars to display as a representation of the percentage of the grand total, as opposed to how they relate to the highest and lowest values in this data. And if you wanted to do something like that, you would need to create a measure, first of all, to work out what the total is as a percentage and what the total profit for each product is as a percentage as well. So it is possible to do something like that, but just be very aware as to what that bar is actually representing. 
And then the final option that we have down here is icon sets. So let's turn these on and let's immediately jump straight into advanced controls. Now this allows you to display an icon again, depending on what the value is within the cells. So we can see that we're applying our icons to the values only. It's based on the total profit field or the sum of total profit. Our icon is going to show to the left of the data and we could change that if we wanted to. And our icon alignment is going to be to the top. We can then choose the icon sets that we'd like to use in our data. And we have icon sets that have three icons, sets that have four icons and also sets that have five icons. And currently the one that I have selected is a three icon icon set. And this makes an important difference when it comes to understanding what these icons are representing. And if you take a look underneath where we have rules, this is how Power BI is assigning an icon to a value. And you'll see that because I've chosen a three icon icon set, it's essentially looking at all of the values in my data and dividing them up into thirds. And you can see here we have them set to percentages 33%, 67 and 100. So this represents thirds in our data. Now we have quite large numbers in our data set. So the best way to explain this would be imagine a number like 12. One to four would be the bottom third. Four to eight would be the middle third. And eight to 12 would be the top third. And it will assign icons based on that. So this is effectively what it's calculating here. It's looking at my data with my large numbers and dividing it into thirds. And it's using that to assign the icons. Now, again, I can jump in here and get a little bit more specific about how I want Power BI to divide up this data. So for this first line, I don't have percentages in my data. I have numbers. So I'm going to change this top line to numbers. And I'm going to say if the value is greater than or equal to zero, but is less than, and I'm going to change this to 400,000. If that is true, then it's going to assign that red icon. Let's go to the next line, change these two numbers. If the value is greater than or equal to, and this time we're going to say 400,000, but is less than, 600,000, then the value will be assigned this yellow triangle. And then the final row, let's change these two numbers and we'll say if the value is greater than or equal to 600,000, but is less than 2 million, then we want a green icon. So you can customize all of these. And then when we click on OK, and this makes it a lot easier for me to read. So I know that anything that has a green circle next to it is greater than 600,000, but less than 2 million. Anything that has a yellow triangle is greater than 400,000, but less than 600,000. And then anything with red is somewhere between zero and 400,000. So don't be afraid to go in there and customize those icons. Now, if we jump back in here one last time, that was all based on a three icon icon set. Now, if we were to choose something like a four icon icon set, you can see that it now divides it into quarters, essentially. And with a five icon set, it's going to divide it into fifths. So just bear that in mind. The number of icons that you choose has an effect on how your data is going to be broken up. So conditional formatting is a great way of making your data more readable and easily highlighting values that are important to you. Now let's take a look at some other popular visualizations in Power BI. So if you remember in the last lesson, we created a matrix table and we've been through and applied different types of formatting to this table. But now what if I decide that I want to change this from a matrix table to something like a bar chart or a clustered column chart? Well, it's pretty simple. All you need to do here is click on your current visualization and then over in the visualizations pane, you just need to select the new visualization that you want to apply. Now, this first row up here are all different kinds of bar chart. So we have a stacked bar chart, a stacked column chart, a clustered bar chart, a clustered column chart, 
a 100% stacked bar chart and a 100% stacked column chart. So for this one, I'm going to go for a very simple clustered column chart. So all I need to do is click and it's going to swap that visualization. So now I have my years running across the bottom and my total profit down the side. But notice that when I had my table, it was showing me the product and the category. But because of the type of chart I've replaced it with, I'm now just seeing my profits summarized by the year. So let's jump in and take a look at our fields. Now you can see here what it's done. In the axis, we have category, product and year but I can't display all of these on one axis. So it's just given me the year. I have total profit as my values, which is absolutely fine, but I also have a legend just here. And currently this is empty. So what I'd probably want to do is grab one of these items from the axes and move it into legend. So again, this is gonna depend on what you want to summarize by. Do I want to summarize by category or by product? So I'm going to do category. I'm just going to drag that down to the legend. And then I could just click the cross to get rid of product from the axes because currently it's not showing me any information. If I drag that back out of legend and back up to axes and drag product down here instead, I get a completely different visualization. Now for me, this is a little bit too much data to be displaying in a visual. I like to keep things fairly small and easy to understand. So I'm going to get rid of product and we're just going to use the category in the legend. Now that I have my data set like this, I could choose any of these other chart visualizations and everything should work nicely. So if I choose stacked bar chart, that's what we're going to get. Stacked column chart, clustered bar chart. We've seen the clustered column. Then we have a 100% stacked bar chart and a 100% stacked column chart. And if we set this back to a cluster column chart, we can then go into our formatting area and start to make some changes to customize this chart. So let's expand general. And again, I'm not going to go through all of these because many of these are kind of similar to the ones that we looked at in the matrix table. So we have all of our positioning options. I'm not going to change anything there. When it comes to the legend, I have this turned on, but I can choose the position. So currently I have it at the top. I could choose to have it at the bottom over on the left or on the right. And I also have some other options here. So top center. And I quite like that one. I think I'm going to leave it in the center just there. I can choose if I want the title of the legend to show. So where it says category, if I don't want that there, I can turn that off, which is going to save me a little bit of space. I could even change the name of the legend just here if I wanted to do that. And I can customize the color, the font and the text size that I'm using. We then have some options for our X axes. For example, we can define the start and end points. And again, we can customize the color, the text size. So if I take this up, you can see that those titles, the year titles are getting bigger. So I'm gonna take those down to, let's set those to 12 points. And I can also do things like adjust the inner padding. So currently this is set to 20%. If I take this all the way up to 43%, you can see that that increases the space between the bars. So I can essentially control this gap width. And I think I'm gonna set it to that. I can choose if I want to display the axis title, in this case year, by turning that off or on. I can change the title color and also what that axis title says. So mine's set to auto, which means it's just going to use the field name. And in this case, I'm fine with that. I can choose to turn grid lines off or on, currently mine are off. If I toggle those on, I don't know if you can see because they're very faint in the background, I do have some grid lines. So let me make those grid lines a bit darker so that you can see exactly what those look like. And there we go. You might want to leave those on or you might not. I can then make the same changes to the Y axes. So I'm going to change the text size from 9 to 12 just to match the other axes, and I can change my display unit. So I have mine currently displaying as millions. If I wanted to, I could choose to display as thousands instead, billions, trillions, or I could say none, which is going to give me the actual values just here. Now, just to save a bit of space, I am going to set these back to millions. Let's move down 
Again, I've got my grid lines on, but I want to make those the same color as the vertical grid lines so that I can see those horizontal grid lines. The next option I have is the zoom slider. Now, currently I have this turned off. If I turn this on, it's going to put these bars underneath and I can choose to show my zoom slider on the X axis or the Y axis. So if I turn off the X axis, I just have one on the Y. I can then use this zoom slider to kind of zoom in on my data. And you'll see as I do that, it's adjusting the granularity of the information that I can see. So if you have quite a lot of complex data and you really want to get into exactly where this bar lies, you can use this zoom slider. Now, I don't want to have that turned on, so let's just turn that off. We then have data colors, and this is where we can define the color of these bars. So I'm going to change these and I think I'm going to have a bit of a purple theme here. So let's go for this aubergine color. I'm going to change food to this pink color. And then finally, pastries is going to be, let's go for a lighter purple color. I can then choose if I want to display data labels. Now let's turn this on and see what we get. Well, this is really cool because it shows us exactly what each of these values are. Again, I can choose the color. I can choose the display unit. So I'm going to keep these on millions. I can choose the orientation. So maybe I want to have those going vertically instead. And I can also choose the position. So currently these are showing on the outside end of the bar. But if I wanted to, I could put those on the inside end of the bar. And I think that looks a lot nicer. And I'm going to take this text size up. Let's make these slightly bigger. I'm going to take it up to 10 points. And I could also customize the font that I'm using. Now, plot area refers to this blank space behind where we have our bars. Now, in general, I like to keep this clean so that the data really stands out. But if you wanted to, you could add an image. So let's click Add Image. And as this is coffee shop data, I'm going to choose this image just here. I'm going to choose the image fit because I can only see a little part of it here. So let's go for fill. And then what I can do is adjust the transparency. So I can take this all the way down and make it a lot lighter. And I'm probably going to go even more transparent. And this in general is the only way that I would use a background image. You really don't want it to distract from your data, but it can look really effective. So my advice is to make that image as transparent as possible so that it doesn't detract from the information that you're trying to convey. Again, we have our title, which we currently have turned on. And we've got our title text in here. Obviously, you can modify that. I'm going to change the colors so that it matches my chart. So let's change the background color. First of all, I'm going to go for this dark purple and the font color. We're just going to change that to white. And of course, I can change that alignment if I want to. Let's put it in the middle and let's make it a little bit bigger. Background will allow us to change the background color of the chart. And just to show you what that looks like, if I was to change this to gray, we get a completely different look and feel. And again, we can adjust the transparency of this color overlay. Now, I think that gray is a bit too dark. Let's go for something like a very pale gray color. And I might even make that a little bit more transparent. A couple of other options I might want to change in here. I could choose to add a border to my entire chart. So let's toggle that on. And if we click away, we can see what that border currently looks like. We can change the color and the radius. Now I'm going to turn the board off because the final option I want to show you in here is this tool tip area. And again, this is something that we skipped over in the last lesson. Now tool tips are very useful. If I hover my mouse over one of these bars, I'm going to get this little tool tip pop up, which is showing me the figures, the information in this chart. So I can see the year, the category of this bar, and the total profit as an exact value. So in general, I always like to have these tooltips enabled. Now you can customize what you're seeing in those tooltips, but you don't do it from this formatting area. You do it over in the fields area. So maybe if I scroll down, you'll see that you have a tooltips area at the bottom here. You can drag and drop fields, and then that information will then appear in the tooltip when you hover over the bar. So maybe I want to be able to see what the total costs are as well as the total profit. 
So what I'm going to do here is grab the total cost field from the sales area and drag that into tooltips. And because I have my tooltips turned on in formatting, now when I hover over, I can also see that total cost. So tooltips are a great way of seeing additional information. So that is pretty much all the customization I want to do here. And all of these formatting options pretty much apply to all of these charts on the top row. I also have other charts that I could switch to. I have a line chart in here. I think we're all reasonably familiar with a line chart. We have area charts, stacked area charts, and also things like line and stacked column charts. So if I want to display two series of data, I could switch to a line and clustered column chart, but then I would need to go in and modify some of these options. For example, I can see that my data labels are now showing in gray and they don't really stand out. So let's expand data label and I'm going to make those white. And if we go back to fields, currently I can only see the columns, but I've selected to display a line chart as well. So if we take a look at my fields, I can see here in line values, I don't currently have anything. So again, if I also wanted to see how the total costs relate to the total profit, I could grab that total cost field and drag it into line values, and that's going to display on my chart as well. Now that I've done that, when I go back into formatting, I'm going to have some additional options in here related to that line chart. For example, if I go down to data colors, you'll see that now I have an additional legend item in here for total cost, which is this blue line. You'll also notice I have an additional formatting option in here as well called shapes. So if I wanted to, I could turn on the shaded area and that's basically going to shade everything below this line. I can also choose if I want to show markers. So if I click this, it's going to show me those markers at the end. I can choose my marker shape. So let's change that to a diamond. My marker color. So maybe I want these to stand out a little bit more. So let's do a nice bright yellow. So I'm going to move to the yellow section and let's do something like that. And this is pretty cool where we have stepped if I turn this on, take a look at what happens to this line. Instead of it being a linear line like we're used to seeing in most charts, we can have this stepped effect instead. So just remember that if you do change the chart type and you add something else in like a line chart, then you're going to need to go back in and review your formatting options because there's going to be some extra things in there that you're going to need to change. Another cool visual that you can use to display data is the card visualization. And I usually see cards being used in Power BI dashboards to show an overview of the information on the dashboard. So a high level overview. And these might be the key metrics that you really just want people to be able to see really easily. And you normally find these cards will be at the top of the dashboard showing your important key metrics. So for example, I'm going to use some measures and add them to cards. So let's add on some cards because they're super simple and really effective. So let's go across to our visualizations. And when you're looking for cards, it's this one just here, which has the one, two, three on it. Now, if I click on the card, when I'm still clicked on my column chart, take a look at what happens. And this is something you have to be really careful of. I find myself doing this all the time. Let's click back to undo that. Make sure that you're clicked on the page and not on any existing visuals. Let's now add our card. There it is at the top. And by default, it's going to resize itself so that it's the same width as the visual below. So in this first card, I'm going to use one of my key measures because I want people to easily be able to see what our total costs have been. So I'm going to drag total costs. I can drag it to this fields area or directly onto the card. Let go. And it's as simple as that. Now I'm going to resize this card so I can easily fit some more on. Let's click away, click our card again. This time I'm going to display the total profit on this card. Let's drag and drop that measure. And again, I'm going to drag this in. Now, when it comes to the sizing of these cards, 
If accuracy is very important to you here and you want to make them all exactly the same size, we can do this through formatting. If we expand general, this is where we can define the width and the height. So if I want to make this one exactly the same width and height as this one, I could click on it, make a note of this, and then just copy those settings across. So 264 and 244, let's change that to 264 and 244, and they're exactly the same. A different way that I could go about this is I could select this first one, Control C to copy, Control V to paste, so now they're exactly the same size, and all I need to do now is replace the total cost with the total profit field. So two different ways that you can ensure that these cards are exactly the same size as each other. Now notice when I drag this over, I'm also getting those alignment guides, which is really going to help me when it comes to aligning these on the page. Let's add another card. I'm going to copy and paste the last one, drag it across, and this time we're going to replace total profit with total sales quantity. Drag and drop onto the card. So these are a very effective way of displaying summary information at a glance. And of course, all of these can be formatted in a very similar way. Make sure you have the card selected, click on format, and then we can go through our different options. So some of the things I'm going to change here, let's take a look. Now with this data label, I can choose my units. So currently I'm displaying in millions. I could say none. That's not going to work too well. I'm going to change that back to millions. The category. Well, if I turn the category off, it's going to remove that label underneath. Now, it's actually quite useful being able to see what exactly that number represents. So we're going to leave that on but I can make some modifications. So I might want to make this a lot bigger than it currently is. So I'm going to take this up to 18 points. I could add an additional title if I wanted to. I can change the background colors. So maybe I want to change this background color to, let's do that dark aubergine color. And because I've done that, I want to go back and just change some of this text. So we're going to change this text here to white. And we're going to go up and we're also going to change the data label color to white as well, just so that stands out a little bit more. And I can give it a border, a shadow. I can add more into that tooltip as well. So currently when I hover over this card, I don't get a tooltip come up. So I need to turn on tooltip. And then when I hover over, I can now see that information, the total cost. Now, what if I want to copy this formatting quickly across to these other two cards so they all look exactly the same? Well, fortunately, I don't have to go through each one applying those settings. What I can do is click on the first card up on the home ribbon, use my format painter, click it once and click to apply that formatting. Let's do it again. Format painter, click to apply. Now that I've done that, I can see this one isn't quite in alignment. So let's change that and put those together at the top. If I want to resize these all in one go, I can select them all by holding down the shift key, right click and group that makes them one object. And then I can use this handle to resize them all in one go. Just remember that once they're grouped, you need to right click and ungroup them again if you want them to be individual cards, which you can then move around independently. The next type of chart I'd like to show you is a map chart. And in Power BI, we have two different kinds of map chart that we can use. The regular map, or the field map. So let me show you the difference between these two. Now for this, just to give ourselves a bit more room, I'm going to create another blank page. So at the bottom where we have page one, I'm going to click the plus symbol to give me page two. And remember, you can rename these pages simply by right clicking, selecting rename. I'm just going to call this map charts and let's give page and let's give page one a rename as well. We'll call this summary. Now, map charts are great for displaying geographical data. And it just so happens that in our data set, we do have a countries table for our stores. 
So this type of data is going to be perfect for a map chart. So let's see how this works. From the visualizations pane, I'm going to click on this globe icon and you can see as I hover over it says map and the one next to it is the field map and there is a bit of a difference between these two. So let's go for the map first of all, let's click to add. It's going to be blank until we add in some fields. So let's now take a look at what we need to add. The first field here is location. So this is where you're going to want to grab your field that contains your geographical information and drop it into here. So for me, I think I'm going to go for country. Let's drag and drop that in. Notice straight away what is happening. Now, if I make this map chart a bit bigger so it's easier to see, it's basically picked up all of the locations in my data set and it's plotted these little bubbles on those locations. Now at the moment, all of these bubbles are the same size. And the idea behind this chart is that you can represent values such as total cost, total profit by the size of the bubble. And you'll notice here, as we go through these fields, there's one at the bottom that represents size. So this is where we can drop the field that is going to define the size of our bubble. So maybe I am interested in, let's go for total profit again. I'm going to drop that into size. And now those bubbles have resized depending on the profit per location. Now, one of the drawbacks of this map chart is, particularly if you have locations that are fairly close together, sometimes these bubbles can start to overlap and things can look a little bit confusing. So just bear that in mind. We are going to make some adjustments, which is going to make this a bit easier to read. But in some cases, particularly if you have lots of bubbles plotted, it's going to be a little bit too chaotic to display your data effectively. Now, I do have some other fields that I could fill in here, and one of them is the legend. So let me just show you what happens if I add a field to this legend area. Let me grab category and drag it into legend. And now you can see each of these bubbles divided up by the different categories, beverages, food and pastries. I could get rid of that and choose something else. So what about year? Let's drag that into legend. And now I can see those figures divided up 2016 to 2019. So you really can display some nice information on this type of chart. Now, for me, I find this level of detail a little bit confusing. I prefer to use this type of chart when I just want to represent the total profit for each of the locations. So I'm going to remove year and just leave it as a plain bubble. Remember, when you hover over these bubbles, again, you're going to get that tooltip information. And we can always add more information into these tooltips by dragging more fields to this tooltip section at the bottom. So maybe I want to grab one of my measures here and also display the average profit. So let's drop that into tooltips. Now when I hover over, I've got my total profit and my average profit. Now let's take a look at some of the formatting options we have for this type of chart. So let's click on format and expand general. Once again, we have some positioning options in here. I don't think I'm going to change anything in there. Let's go straight down to data colors. Now, this is where you can change the color of that bubble to match maybe the theme that you're using. So let's go for, I'm going to go for this dark red color again. Now, if you want to have each country's bubble represented with a different color, you can definitely do that as well. All you need to do is toggle on show all, and then you can go through and you can define a color for the bubble for each of these locations. Now, I'm going to leave mine all on purple just to save a little bit of time. If we go to category, this is where I can add some data labels effectively. So if I toggle this on, it's going to show me those countries data labels. And again, this can get a little bit chaotic if you have lots of locations very close to each other. Let's go down to bubbles. Well, this is where we can change the size of the bubbles. So if I want to make those a little bit smaller, I can do that which sometimes makes them a little bit more manageable. Now I'm going to take those up to about 17. Let's expand map controls. Well, I currently have auto zoom on, but if I turn this off and then choose to display zoom buttons instead, you can see that I can then control the zoom much like you would something like Google maps. I can click the plus to zoom in the plus again, 
and then I can just drag that map around if I want to take a closer look at a particular region. So this sometimes works a little bit better if you have lots of overlapping bubbles because you do still have the ability to zoom in and see those a little bit clearer. I then have access to different map styles. So currently this theme is the road theme. But in this drop down we have Arial, which looks pretty cool, I must say. And then we have a dark theme, can't really see too much there, a light theme, which is quite nice. And then we have a grayscale theme as well. So choose whichever one you like the best and showcases your data in the best way. Now, I think I'm going to go for Arial because I quite like that one. And now that I've done that, I think I'm going to make my bubbles a little bit bigger. So let's just increase those like so. Perfect. And then most of these other options we've already covered in other chart types. We can customize things like the title, the background, the aspect ratio. We can add a border, a shadow, and you've seen how we can change those tooltips. Now for this title, I think I am actually going to change this. I'm going to change the font color to white and we're going to have the background color just so it suits the style of the map a little bit more. So lots of cool things we can do here with this map chart. And of course, remember, you can drag around. So if you want to go over and see a different area, then you can definitely do that as well. Now, the difference between this map chart and a filled map chart is that the filled map chart doesn't display bubbles. Instead, the entire country will be shaded if there's values for it in your data. So let me just make this chart a bit smaller. I'm just going to drag that in like so. And let's click on filled map chart. Now, once again, we need to go in and add in our different locations. Now, I will say that my data doesn't really suit this filled map chart, and I'll show you why. In the location, I'm going to add my countries in again. So it's going to find those countries and notice that it's shading them in as opposed to showing me a bubble representation. And if we go to our formatting, let's go to uh, data colors. The default color there is blue. So let's do this in a dark purple color as well. And I'm going to say show all because this time I actually do want to shade the countries in different colors. So we'll keep Australia as purple. Let's do Austria as a lighter purple and let's just do some crazy colors so they really stand out. So we'll have blue here and I'm just going to go through and change all of the colors for these different countries. And there we go. So that now makes it a little bit easier to see. Once again, I can use my map control. So I'm going to turn off auto zoom and turn on my zoom buttons. And once again, this is going to allow me to zoom in to a specific region. So let's zoom back in on Europe because this is the easiest one to see. And there we go. Let's take a look at our map styles. Well, again, we have the same map style, so I'm going to make this one aerial as well. And then we have similar options below to add things like a title, background, border, shadow, tooltip. So that is the main difference between these two different charts. One shows as bubbles for a representation of the values, whereas the other one just shades the country. But both of them are really effective and really nice ways of displaying geographical data. The next visualization that can look really effective in your dashboards is the gauge. And it's this little icon here. Now, if you're not sure what the gauge is, you might be able to tell from that very small icon. It's basically an arc with an arrow which shows us KPI information. For example, we might have a target to meet and we want to be able to see in a visualization how close we are to that target. And for this, we're going to do this in a slightly different way. And this is also going to show us how to utilize another skill, and that is how to enter data manually. Now, we briefly touched on this much earlier on in the course, but we're going to do it again so you can see one of the other options you have when it comes to getting data into these visualizations. So the first thing to do here is add the gauge visualization. So let's click it. As always, we're going to get a blank visualization. Now, normally at this stage, I would grab my field codes and start adding them into these value areas. 
But this time I'm going to use some data that I have stored off in an Excel spreadsheet. So let's jump across to Excel and look at the data that we're going to use. So here I have a very small data set and you'll find this data set in the course files folder to download. It's just displaying some year information, 2016 to 2019. We then have a minimum and a maximum value showing as a percentage. We have our target KPI, our actual KPI, and what that represents in terms of sales revenue. Now, in order to display our data in a gauge, we need to have all of this information. Because what this gauge is going to do, if I move my Excel spreadsheet to the side, you can see here we have this arc. And effectively, I want four of these gauges running across the top of my dashboard, and each one is going to represent one of these four years. So if we start with 2016, the minimum value needs to be specified. So basically, what is the value going to be at the bottom on the left hand side of this gauge? Well, it's going to be zero. And then we need to specify a maximum value, which is effectively going to be on the right hand side of this gauge. So I'm going to set that to 200% and you can set that to whatever you want. And then we have our target KPI. So I'm going to set that at 100%, which is basically going to be somewhere in the middle of this gauge. And then we have the actual KPI. So this first one, for example, 65%, I would expect this gauge to show that at about this level on the gauge because we have zero over here. 200 over here and our target 100 is going to be in the middle. So straight away, we're going to be able to see how close to our target we actually are. And the reason why I set this maximum value to 200% as opposed to 100 is because sometimes we've exceeded our KPI. So our target is 100%, but in 2018 and 2019, we exceeded that KPI 110% and 140%. So I'm still going to be able to plot these nicely on this gauge visual. So now that we have this small data set, it's time to get this into this visualization. And what we're going to do here is we're going to enter the data manually. So we don't have to always import our data in. If it's a very small data set, we could create our own table and then use that in the visualization. So what we're going to do here is we're going to select all of this data, control A and control C to copy. We're going to go back to our visualization and we're going to enter this data manually. So up on the home tab into enter data. And we were in here before, but if you remember last time, we didn't actually enter anything into the table. We just wanted to create a blank table. This time we are going to add our data. So make sure that you're clicked in that first cell, control V to copy that data in. I'm getting a warning message. Power BI is telling me that the first row of data that I've pasted has been promoted to column headers. And that's actually perfect. That is exactly what I want. The last thing to do here is to rename this table. So I'm going to call this 2016 to 2019. KPIs. And I'm going to load that in. So once it's loaded, we should be able to see that new table over on the right hand side. And there it is. If I expand this out, I can then see all of my different column headings. Now, I always like to jump across to data and just check to make sure this data looks as I want it to look. And I can immediately see here that I need to do some work on this formatting. So these should be percentages. So let's select this first column just here, change that to percentage. I'm also going to change the data type because it's saying it's a decimal number. I'm going to change that to whole number. And let's take these decimal places down. I'm going to do exactly the same for these other columns. Let's change to whole number and change that data type. Let's change it to a percentage and take those decimal places down. And I'm going to do the same for the other two columns. And then the final column here for sales revenue, let's just select that. And we're going to change that to a currency. We're going to use pounds. And yep, I think that looks good. So let's jump back to our visualization. So now that we have this information, we can use it to build our gauge. Now I want this first gauge to show the KPIs for 2016 only. And if I just start adding fields in, it's basically going to use all of the data. So 2016 to 2019. 
So in order for this to work, we need to apply some filtering first so that we're just using the 2016 data. So for this, we're going to use this filters pane just here. And we haven't really used this much so far in this course. So this is going to give you a nice little introduction. So let's expand it out. This is where we can apply filters to our visualization. So the first thing I need to tell this filters area is which field I want to filter on. Well, I want to filter on the year. So I'm going to go to my KPIs table, grab the year field and drop that into filters on this visual. I'm then going to go into basic filtering and then I can select the year I'm interested in. So I want to see information only for 2016 in this visual. Now that I've done that, I can collapse that pane back up again and I can go through and start adding my fields to these areas. So my value is going to be my actual KPI. Let's drop that in. My minimum value. Well, my minimum value is 0% and you should see that now displayed on the left hand side of this gauge. I'm going to grab max and drop that into maximum value. And now you can see 200% displayed on the right hand side of the gauge. Add target value. We're going to grab our target KPI and drop that in. And there is our 100% target line. And then we have our tool tips at the bottom. So remember, if we hover over, this is going to show us the actual KPI and the target. But maybe I want to see what that represents in sales revenue. So I'm going to grab the sales revenue field, drop that into tool tips. Now when I hover over, I can see what the monetary value is relating to that KPI. And that is pretty much it. We can then go through and start formatting. So if we go to data colors, I can change the fill to match my theme. So let's go for a dark purple. I'm going to keep my target on dark blue and I've already got my data labels turned on here. So I can choose the units that I want to display those in and change things like the text size and the font. I maybe want to add a background so I could come in here and make that background gray or maybe a completely different color so that everything stands out. I can go in and modify the title, so on and so forth. So you would format this the same way that you would any other visualization. And I think I'm actually going to change that background because I really don't like that purple. So let's change that back to white. So what I could do then is maybe resize this visualization just a little bit and then I could copy and paste it and then change the filter that I'm using. So this one needs to show the information for 2017. I'm going to expand out my filters. Let's click on year. And this time we're going to swap this from 2016 to 2017. And it is as simple as that. So very quick just to copy and paste these across and display the data for all of the different years. And what you might find is if you have four of these running across the top, you don't want a title for each of them. You can turn off the title and use the text box on your home tab just to give it a universal title. But we'll talk more about that when we go into designing dashboards. But that is it. That is how you create gauge visualizations. Since the last lesson, I've done a little bit of arranging on this page. So I've copied over the map chart and also the gauge charts from the map charts page and just simply copied them onto the summary page. I've resized them and moved them around a little bit just so they fit on the page a little bit better. But I've left a gap down the side because this is what we're going to be working with in this lesson. It's now time for us to add some interactivity into our Power BI report. And we're going to do this using slices and filters. And again, slices might be something that you're familiar with in an application like Excel. We often use them to filter charts and pivot charts. And they're a really nice visual way to help users extract from your report exactly the information that they're interested in. So let me show you how we can add some slices to our report page. Now, once again, we're going to use a visualization for this. And the slicer visualization is this one just here, the one with the little funnel icon on it. So let's click to add a slicer. And as usual, it is blank until we add some data to it. So what we can basically do here is we can use any of the fields that exist in our data 
as a filter or a slicer for this data. And you can have multiple slicers in your report. So I'm going to add a few of them just so you can see how these work. Now, the first slicer that I'm going to add, if I go over to my fields, I think I'm going to add a slicer or a filter for the products. So from the products table, let's grab the product field and drag and drop that into the field area. And now you can see what I get. So in this slicer, I now have all of the products in a big, long list. And this list is pretty long. In fact, it goes off the edge of the page. Now, the idea behind this is that users can simply click to select the information that they're interested in and the charts on this page will update. Now, bear in mind these gauges at the top, I don't really want those to update because those are KPIs based on if we've met a target or not. So I don't particularly want those changing, which is quite handy because they're not actually linked to these slicers because I entered the data manually. However, if I was to select a product from this list, when I select it, if you look at all of the other charts on this page, you'll see that they will change. So let's select BLT sandwich and you can see everything is changing as I select. If I want to select multiple options, I can hold down my control key and I can select multiple products and that will reflect in the charts on this report page. To clear your slices and set everything back to the default, just click the eraser icon to clear your selections. Now, as I mentioned, this list of products that I have in here is pretty long. And I don't really want to have to be scrolling up and down looking for the particular product that I want. This also makes this slicer not particularly space efficient. If I want to add more slices underneath, this is going to get cumbersome very quickly. So what you can do here is change this from a list to a drop down menu. And we do that simply by clicking this little drop down arrow and then we can select the type of slicer that we want. So I'm going to change this to drop down. And now I have something which is a lot neater and cleaner to look at. I can then click the drop down and then go in and select what I want to filter by. Now I'm going to do a bit of resizing here because that is a bit wide and it's going off the page. Let's move that in to about there. Perfect. Let's now do some formatting just to make this feel like it's part of this report. I'm going to jump over to my formatting tools and I'm not going to do much formatting here. But one thing I am going to do is I'm going to expand the slicer header and I'm going to say that I want a bottom only outline. That's going to give me this line underneath the heading. And what I tend to like to do on reports and dashboards is use color to group together these slices. So if I have slices that are all from the products table, I might give the underline the same color. So to change the color of the underline, you have to do that from a different area. Let's go to general. I'm actually going to change the weight of that to two and we're going to change the outline color to purple. And there we have our first slicer. I'm going to add another one for the category. Now, as with anything in Power BI, I don't have to go back in and add a slicer visualization from scratch. I can simply copy and paste the existing slicer. So select it, control C, control V, and that's going to give you a copy. And I'm going to place that directly under the product slicer. Now, all I need to do is go over to my fields pane click the cross to remove product and I'm going to replace it with category. So now when I click the drop down, I can filter by category as well. Now this is also part of the products table. So I'm going to leave that underline as purple because these are both from the same table. Let's do the same process. I'm going to copy control C, control V to paste. Let's drag this one underneath. And this time we're going to use a field from the locations table. So I'm going to grab location and drag and drop that into field. And now I have a big long list of locations that I can select from. Now this is from a different table. So let's change that line color to separate it from the other two. So into formatting, all I need to do here is go to general and change the outline color. I'm going to change this to let's do a nice blue color like so. 
Now, one other thing that's worth pointing out here is if you have a drop down menu that has a very long list of data like this one just here, you can help your users out a little bit by adding the ability to search through this list so they can easily find what they're looking for. So what we can do here is click on the slicer, click the three dots, and you can see the first option we have in the menu is search. So if we click that, now when they go to the drop down, they get this little search bar at the top here so they can then type in exactly what it is that they're looking for. So that can be a super helpful little thing. Now the final slicer that I'm going to add to this page is a date slicer because there is a slight difference with slicers that deal with dates. So let's copy our slicer, control C, control V. Let's position it. Let's go to our field pane, remove location. I'm going to go to the dates table and I'm going to grab year, drag and drop that into field. Let's go to the format tab and let's just change the outline color because that is coming from a different table. And we're going to change this one to pink. So when I click this, you'll see that I can filter on my dates 2016 to 2019. Now, because Power BI recognizes that these are dates, if I click the little drop down, you'll see that aside from list and drop down, I now get between, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. So if I'm looking for something specifically between two dates, I can then use this slider. So if I'm only interested in things that are between 2017 and 2019, I can just use that slider. And you won't see those options on any of these other slices. They are very specific to date slices. So just be aware of that. Now I'm going to switch this one back to drop down, but that is pretty much it. We can now go in and we can select all of the options that we're interested in. So we can select a few different products. I can then go to location and select a few different locations. And I can then go to the year that I'm interested in. So let's say 2018. And there we go. My cards, my column chart and my map chart have all updated to reflect my slicer selections. So I just want to end this section by just briefly showing you some of the other design elements that you can change in your report. Because so far when we've been applying formatting, it's very much been visualization based. We've selected a particular visualization on the reports, and then we've used our format area to apply different formatting settings. But you do have other options on the ribbons that allow you to make more universal changes to the look and feel of your report. So let's look at some of them now. If we jump up to the view tab, you'll see in the first group, we can change the overall theme and themes are a great way to very quickly apply formatting, different colors, different font styles with the click of one button. So if we click the drop down here, we have access to quite a few themes in this gallery. And I'll leave it to you to go through some of these and experiment with the different colors. Now, for example, I'm going to apply this one just here, Tidal. Now, when I click this, you can see what that looks like. Instantly, a little bit more interesting, and I haven't had to format every single element individually. So themes are a great way to quickly change the look and feel of your report. If we go across to the Insert ribbon, we also have some other options in here. So for example, if we want to add a new page, we can add a blank page or a duplicate page from here. Remember, you can also do that by clicking the plus at the bottom where we have our tabs. We can add new visuals from here as opposed to clicking on the visualization in the visualizations pane. And then we can also add different AI visuals. Now, I'm not really going to go into these in this particular lesson, but one that I will point out to you is this one just here, this smart narrative, because this is quite a nice way of auto generating a summary of the data that you have on your report. So if you kind of want a couple of paragraphs of text, which gives an overview of the data you're displaying, this is what smart narrative does. Now, I don't have a great deal of blank space on this page, so it might be a little bit difficult to see. But if I click Smart Narrative, it opens up this little text box and take a look at what we have in here. So it's given me a summary of my report. It's telling me that beverages had the highest total profit and then it's given me the value followed by food and pastries. Total profit and total cost are positively correlated with each other. 
so on and so forth. So this is something that's quite nice that you can add to your report page if you just want a quick written summary of what your report is showing. So I quite like that little option. And then in the group on the end, we have different elements that we can add. So if you want to add a text box to the page, then you have that option just here. So it might be that I want to add a title for this report at the top here. I would do that using a text box. And this brings me on to my other little tip here, and that is grouping your objects together in order to be able to move them as a whole. So currently, if I wanted to add a title to this report, I don't really have any room. I haven't allowed any space at the top. So I might want to resize these visuals and move them down a little bit. And I don't really want to be selecting them all individually, moving them down and resizing them. That's not going to be very time efficient. I want a way of doing this all together. So what we can do here is we can go to the view menu and in the show panes area, we have a selection pane. And this allows us to do things like change the layer order, but it also allows us to select all of the elements on our page. So if I select the top one, go down to the last one, hold down shift, it's going to select everything on the page. What I can then do is right click my mouse and group all of these elements together in one big element. I can then use my resize handles to resize everything as a whole. And if I want to maintain the aspect ratio, I just need to make sure I hold down shift as I resize. So let's make this quite a bit smaller. And I'm then going to move the group as a whole a bit further down the page so that I have a bit of space at the top for a title. And I think I'm going to drag that out a little bit as well. So there we go. Now, if you want to go back to editing these elements individually, you must make sure that you right click and ungroup them before you continue. So now that I have some space, let's go back to insert and we can add a text box. And I'm just going to give my report a title. And we'll call this mega coffee sales analysis 2016 to 2019. And this is just a regular text box, which we can then format. So let's select the text. I'm going to leave it on Sego UI because I quite like that. But let's make this font a little bit bigger. I'm going to change that to 24 and let's move that up to the top of the page. Now, if I want to make any other changes to this text box, such as maybe removing that background fill, Notice that now over on the right hand side, I have a format text box pane, which gives me access to a lot of the similar options that we have when we're formatting a visualization. So let's turn the background off and then I'm going to change this font color to white. And let's also make it bold. Why not? Click away and there we go. Some other things that I can add here are different types of buttons. Now, if we click the drop down, I can add things like a left arrow, a right arrow, a reset, a back and information, help Q&A, so many different things that we can add. So, for example, if I click on back, this is going to give me this little back arrow just here. Now, I'm going to place this over at the side of my report. And once again, we have the format button pane open on the right hand side to allow us to customize this button. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to turn the background off and then we're going to change the icon to white and I'm going to turn on text as well and make that font color white. And the text that I'm going to add here is the word back. Let's make that text a little bit bigger. And yep, yeah, that is it. And the idea behind buttons like this is that you can press control and click them. And this one, for example, is going to jump you back to the previous page in this report. So if I now click back, it's going to take me to the other page that I have, which is essentially the map charts page. So things like buttons can really help you with navigation and giving users information and help. And then the final two options we have, we can add some shapes to our report. This is probably fairly self-explanatory if we want to add something like a block arrow 
We can do that. We can add rectangles, circles to add to the design, and we can also add our own images to our report. So definitely some additional really cool features in there, which are going to help you elevate the overall look and feel of your report and make it super visual and easy for people to understand. So now it's time for us to move into the design section of this course. And really, when it comes to designing reports, you're pretty much free to do whatever you want. So the way that I'm designing my report isn't necessarily how you have to do yours. It's really down to personal preference. But I'm going to show you some very quick techniques that are going to enable you to build a really nice looking report. And we're going to do this step by step. And in this first lesson, I just want to show you how to add a report title. So you can see up on the screen now exactly what we're going to recreate. And this is just a very simple report title. It just says overview sales analysis report. We have some shapes in here. We have a little icon. And if you also notice at the bottom, I've added a few different pages. So currently I'm clicked on the page labeled all, but then I have four other pages which are going to display the data for those specific years. So let me show you how I created this. So we're starting back at the beginning. We're on our report page. And as you can see at the bottom, I've already renamed this page to all. So what we're going to do now is just add four more pages. So I just need to click the plus, click the plus again, and carry on clicking until I have all of the pages that I need. Now it's a simple case of right clicking and renaming the page. So this first one will be for 2017, the next one for 2018, the next one for 2019, final one is going to be for 2020. And let's jump back to the all page. So on this page, this is where we're going to display all of the data for all of the years. So I'm going to add a report title. Now, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to change the wallpaper or the page background. So for this, just make sure that you click somewhere on the background across to formatting. And remember, it's this wallpaper section that you want to change, not page background. So currently it's set to white. Let's change this to a light gray color. And I'm going to do exactly the same on all of these pages. So let's go through and change that color. Right, brilliant. So let's go back to the all page and build our report heading, our report title. So for this, we're going to jump up to insert and we're going to be using the elements section just here. So the first thing I'm going to do is select the rectangle tool. By default, that shape is going to be blue, but I'm going to drag it all the way out to the edge of the report and let's drag it up. And I think that's about the right size. Now, if I go over to my format shape pane, I'm going to change that fill color from blue to white. Now, notice when I click away, this shape actually has an outline. So I want to remove that as well. And all I need to do here is toggle the outline off. Next, I'm going to go back to my shapes. Let's add another rectangle. And this time I'm just going to make a square shape that kind of fits into this area up here. So you can always use those alignment guides to get this exact. And I think that is about right. Let's now change the fill color. So click on the blue shape over to fill. I'm going to click the drop down. And I'm going to make this a dark green. And what I want to do here is basically add a little icon. Now icon sets aren't included in Power BI but you can download icons from websites like the Noun Project. You can even use PowerPoint icons. So if you open up PowerPoint and insert an icon, you can right click and save that icon off to your local drives and then use it in your Power BI report. So I already have one saved off. So I'm going to use my elements group again and jump across to image. There is the image that I'm going to use. Let's select it and click open. There is my image. Let's resize this using the handles and make it a little bit smaller. I'm going to hold down shift as I drag this in. And then I can place that on top of this green square. Now, if you need to make very minor adjustments and you're struggling to do that using your mouse, remember you can use 
your arrow keys. Now I'm going to make this very slightly smaller so it fits nicely in the center. The final thing I want to do here is add some text. So for this, we're going to use the text box. Now I want two text boxes here. The first one is just going to say overview and I'm going to apply some formatting to this. So I'm going to keep it on this font, but I'm going to take that up to 16 points and make it bold. I'm going to click the font drop down and let's change it to this teal color. Now all I need to do is resize this text box. I'm going to drag that in and I don't really want this white background. So again, over to the format text box and we're going to turn off the background and then drag that up into position. So now I want to add another text box. And again, the easiest thing to do here is simply control C, control V to make a copy of your text box. And then I can just modify the text in here. And this is going to be a bit longer. I want this to say sales analysis report. Now I want to make this a little bit smaller. So let's take this down to 14 and I'm going to turn off bold as well. Once I've done that, I can then move that into position. And remember, if you want to make minor adjustments, you can just use your arrow keys. Now I'm going to select both of these text boxes and I'm going to group them together. So now they are effectively one object, which means I can move them around in one big block. Perfect. So now we have our report title. So I'm basically going to do this on all of the pages and to differentiate the different pages, I might decide to maybe change the icon or maybe change the color of the background square or font. Again, these decisions are really up to you. But a quick way to get this across all of the pages is to group everything together using the selection pane. So if we go to the view tab and open up the selection pane, this is going to show us all of the objects essentially that we have on this report page. And because I have them grouped, I can see here they're called group one. Now what I can do here is make this a bit more meaningful by giving them better names. So I'm going to call this title. This image here is that chart icon. So I'm going to double click and call this chart icon. This shape just here is that green square. So let's call it green square. So we know what we're dealing with. And then the final shape just here is the title background. So double click and I'm going to call this title background. And what I can also use this selection pane for is moving elements around, changing the layer order effectively, or I can use it to group everything together. So if I hold down shift and select everything in this selection pane, it's going to select all of the elements that I have on my page. And now effectively I can right click, go to group, group everything together. And now I can copy and paste these across the other pages in one big block. So control C, Let's jump across to the 2017 page, control V to paste. And I can just do exactly the same on all of these pages. Now, if I go back to 2017, I might want to change this title or maybe the colors of this green square. Now, remember, if you want to go back to editing individual elements, you're going to have to ungroup everything first. So I'll just show you this first example and then I'll leave you to do the rest. So I'm going to change the text here and I'm going to change this to 2017. I'm going to leave it on sales analysis report, but I am going to change the background color of this square. Now, when I clicked on this green square, it looks like I am actually clicked on it. But if I take a look in the selection pane, I can see that I'm actually clicked on the chart icon. So this is why I like to have this pane open, because sometimes what you're actually clicked on isn't what it looks like on the page. So let's select green square. Now I'm going to change the fill color from a green to let's do a blue color. And there we go. And then I might decide that I want to change the color of the text to match that new icon. So let's do a dark blue and the same for the subheading as well. 
And there we go. So I'm going to go through the rest of these off camera and just change the background color of the square and also the text. So join me back here in a few moments. And there we go. We now have some really nice looking report titles. Join me in the next lesson where we'll continue building this report. So what we're going to do next is we're going to add some navigation to our reports so the user can interact with the report easily and efficiently. And the way that we're going to add navigation is by using buttons and also bookmarks. So effectively, what I want to be able to do here is I want to add some buttons to this overview page for each of the years. So I want one button to say 2017, 2018, 2019 and 2020. And when the user clicks on this button, it's going to jump them to the relevant page in this report. So a really nice way of adding interaction. Now, the way that we do this is by using bookmarks. And you might be familiar with bookmarks in an application like Word. It's kind of similar in many ways. Effectively, what we need to do here is go to all the pages that we're going to link to, for example, this 2017 page, add a bookmark, and then we can create a link from the button to the bookmark, which will effectively jump us across to that page. So the first thing we want to do here is we want to add a bookmark to each page in our report. So currently I'm clicked on all. And for this, we need to go up to the view menu and into bookmarks. And that's going to open this bookmarks pane on the right hand side. Currently, we don't have any bookmarks. So let's add one. And this is going to be a bookmark on the page all. Now I'm going to rename this bookmark by double clicking and just changing it to all. Let's move across to the 2017 page. Let's add another bookmark, double click and call this one 2017. Let's move across to 2018, add a bookmark, double click 2018. You can see where we're going with this. Let's move across to the 2019 page, add a bookmark, double click 2019. And the final one, let's go to 2020, add a bookmark, double click and 2020. Now, one important thing to note here about these bookmarks, if you click the three dots, notice that you have data display and current page selected. And that is because bookmarks do a lot more than just assist you with navigation. And if you have data and display selected for your bookmark, when you click on that bookmark, it can start to mess with things like filters in your report. The only thing we want to use these bookmarks for in this particular instance is navigation. So we need to make sure we go through and deselect data and display. And this is a really important step or you're going to find that you do run into a few different problems. So let's just quickly go through and deselect data and display from all of these. And the final one here for 2020, like so. OK, so we have our bookmarks assigned to each page. Let's go back to all. Now what I want to do is I want to add some navigation buttons. So for this, we're going to go up to insert into buttons and I'm going to choose this blank button at the bottom. And the reason why I like blank buttons is that I can just fully customize them to suit my needs. So let's go for blank. It inserts a little blank button just here. I'm going to move it down and let's resize it so it is a similar size to that green square above. So I think right there will do. Let's apply some formatting to this button. So let's add a shape fill. Let's turn this on. And the cool thing about this is that you can change the shape fill depending on the state of the button. So default state, which is what you see on the report, the fill is white. But I could choose to change the fill color when the user hovers the mouse over the button, when they press or when it's disabled. So my default state is going to be white, but on the hover, I want the button to change to a dark gray color and I want the text to change to white. So I want to make sure I select on hover here as well and the font color is going to be white. 
So let's just test that out. If I hover over, it changes to that dark gray. I currently don't have any text in here, so let's add some. Let's click the button again, go down to text, and the text is going to say all. And once again, you can come in here and you can modify the font color, whatever you want to change. Now notice that when I hover over, because I selected white text for the hover state, it's changing to white. So a really nice little effect there, which helps users see what they're clicking on. Now I might want to add in another state here. So maybe once they've clicked on it, I want the button to change color again. So let's go back up to fill and change this to on press. And this time I want the fill to be that dark green color. And the text is going to be white. Perfect. So I think I also want this text to be a little bit bigger. And the cool thing here is that you don't have to change it for each state. If you just change it for one of them, so in this case, the default state, I'm going to take this up to, let's take it up to 14. That's going to change it for the on hover state and also the on press state as well. So that's looking pretty good. Not a big fan of that thick border around the outside. So let's change that as well. Let's see what it looks like with the outline off. Not too bad, but I think I do actually want an outline. I just don't want it to be quite as thick. So we'll leave it on dark gray, but I'm going to take the outline weight down to one. And there we go. We have a nice clickable button. So now that I have this, I want one for all of the other years as well. So again, instead of creating these buttons from scratch each time, we're just going to copy control C and paste. And then we can drag that into place underneath. All I need to do now is basically change the text label. So let's click on the button. Let's go to text and we want this one to say 2017. And we're going to repeat this process. Control C, Control V, drag it down. Let's go to text and change that to 2018. I'm going to do two more, control C, control V, drag down 2019, and then finally control C, control V. Let's drag that down and change the label to 2020. Perfect. Those are my report buttons. So now we have these looking as we want them to look, we need to link them to the bookmarks on the various different pages. So let's click on this first one, which is essentially just going to stay on this page. So over in the format area, all the way at the bottom, we have an actions menu. So we want to add an action to this button. And this is where you go to link your button to the different pages. But remember, we're linking to a bookmark. The bookmark we're going to link this one to is on the all page. And I could add a tooltip here as well. So maybe click to jump to all. So now when I hover over this button, you're going to see that tooltip. So all of these little things really help the users. It guides them through your report navigation. Let's go to the next button. Let's turn on actions. We're going to link this to a bookmark again. And the bookmark we're going to link to is 2017. Click to jump to 2017 and hit enter. Now, what I'm actually going to do here is I'm just going to copy this text so I don't have to keep typing it each time. Go to the next one, turn on actions, link it to a bookmark. We're going to link it to 2018. Control V to paste in our tooltip and just change that to 2018. Let's do the final two. Turn on our actions, link it to a bookmark. The bookmark this time is 2019. Add tooltip. Let's change that to 2019. And then the final one just here. Let's link it through to our bookmark, this time 2020. And our tooltip will be for 2020. And hit enter. So now it's time to test these buttons out. Now, when you're clicking buttons, you have to hold down the control key to get them to work. 
So if I want to jump across to the 2019 page, notice at the bottom we're currently on all because we have the yellow line underneath it. If I hold down control and click on 2019, it's going to jump me across to that page. And what I'm probably going to want to do is add these buttons to all of these pages. So again, we can group these together. So I'm going to hold down my shift key this time and just select all of the buttons, right click, group, and now I can do control C, go across to 2017 and paste them in, 2018, paste, 2019, paste, and I'm just pressing control V here as I do this, and paste them in. And just test to make sure that those all work. So that is how you can add navigation buttons using bookmarks. So now it's time to start adding some visualizations to our report. And since the last lesson, I have made a couple of tiny changes to those navigation buttons. I decided I didn't actually like the border around the outside, the outline. So I've just removed the outline and I've also moved all of the buttons a little bit further up the page so that they're directly under this icon. So now I'm ready to add in my high level overview statistics. So these are the statistics that I want on every single page, which basically give me an overview of some of the key metrics that we're interested in. And I'm going to do this using cards. And you've seen how we can use cards in previous lessons. So this should be reasonably straightforward. Now, if I go across to my fields, I'm going to be using the measures that I've created to create a few cards. And I'm going to place them at the top here where we have overview and sales analysis report. Now these cards are going to differ on each page because on this first page, I want them to show all of the years. On this page, I want them to show just the information for 2017, 2018, 2019, so on and so forth. So we need to do a little bit of filtering on these other report pages. But let's deal with all first of all, because this one's going to be the most straightforward. So the metrics that I want to display at the top here are going to be the order count, the total cost, the total profit, and the total revenue. So let's add our first card visualization. And it's this one just here with the one, two, three icon. Let's click to add. Now your visualization will always resize itself to the width or the length of the longest item on your page. So for me, that is this white bar at the top. So let's resize this because we definitely don't want the card to be that big. I'm just going to drag that to there. Now, this is a very simple case of dragging and dropping the measure onto the card or into this fields area. So the first thing I want to display here is the total order count, how many orders we've had. So I'm going to drag and drop that to fields and that's going to display my order count. Now, of course, we can do some formatting here, but what I'm going to do is add all my cards first and then we're going to format them. So that's the first card. Again, a nice quick way of adding another one is to just copy and paste, control C, control V, and then we can just switch out the KPI that we're using. So let's deselect order count. And this time we're going to show total revenue. Let's do exactly the same, control C, control V. For this card, I want to show the total cost, control C, control V. And for this card, I want to show the total profit. So now that we have these metrics, we can now start to format them because currently these are way too big. I want these to go up here in this title area. So let's first start by resizing. Now you can see as I do that, I kind of lose some of the text. So we need to resize the text within this card. So let's go across to formatting. And let's expand data label. Now the data label basically refers to the number that you see here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the color of this number to a green to match the theme. I can then choose how I want to display the units. So this is just a simple count. So what I might want to do here is change this to thousands, which gives me 9K, millions, billions or trillions. So it depends how granular you want to be here. Do you want people to see the exact figure? or kind of what it's nearest to. Now I'm going to just go with none to display the entire amount. 
The text size, now we need to take this down a little bit because currently it is quite large. So I'm going to take this down to 24 and see what that looks like. I think possibly we could go slightly bigger with this. Yeah, I think I'm going to take that up to 30 for the time being. I may decide to change that at a later date. Let's scroll down and deal with the category. So the category is order count that you can see underneath. So this name is going to be whatever the name of the measure is. Now I'm happy to leave this color on that gray, but again, I do want to take this down and make it a little bit smaller. So I'm going to take that down to 11 points. Now, if you want to format this category, maybe move it above the number, then there isn't actually an option in formatting to do that. So what you would need to do here, if you wanted to have a little bit more control, is turn off the category, and then you could use a text box to add your own title. Now, just for this demonstration, I'm going to turn order count on. So now I want to resize this entire thing. And again, I can see that it's still not quite fitting correctly. So I'm probably going to want to adjust my text size. So let's take this all the way down. And there we go. I think that will do for the time being. So once you have your formatting set for one of the cards, instead of having to do the same for all of the others, we can simply use our format painter to apply the same formatting to the other cards. So let's select the text box up to home and select format painter. Now all I need to do is click on the next one and it's going to make it look exactly the same, which is perfect. Format painter, click, format painter, click. And then all I need to do is resize these boxes. So let's resize this. Let's drag it up and make that a little bit smaller like that. Let's do the same thing here for the total cost. Let's drag it up. And also drag it in and the same one just here. Let's do that. Drag it up and drag it in. And of course, remember for some of these other numbers, if you want to change these to thousands, millions, billions, then just jump back into formatting and underneath data label, you can change the display units here. So I could choose to display this as millions. In fact, I think that does look a little bit better. Let's go for that. Now for this one, I think I'm going to display this as thousands. And this one, I think this needs to go to millions as well. Yes, it does. So change the formatting accordingly. Now, another little tip here, if you want to make sure these are spread out nice and evenly across the width of your report, what you can do is just arrange them roughly to where you want them to be. So I want this one to be more towards the end. And then you can select all of them and use your alignment tools. So if we go to format and align, if I choose distribute horizontally, it's going to space these nice and evenly across the top of your report. And then if I want to go a bit further here, I might want to add some nice little design elements. So for example, I might decide I want to add a shape and I'm going to go for a rectangle just here. Once again, I'm going to get this big blue block. Let's make this a lot smaller. And I might decide just to have one of these separating each of those different cards. So once again, let's go across. I want to change the fill color and let's change this to that tealy blue color again. So let's go for something like that. And I don't want an outline on this either. So let's turn the outline off. Now I'm simply going to control C, control V and add one of these next to each of these card values. And again, you don't necessarily have to do this, but these little things do make your report look a lot nicer and a lot easier for people to read. So these cards are currently referring to all of the data. So that is the total order count across all years and the same for rev, cost and profit. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy these cards and also these lines. Now for this, because we have quite a few things, I'm going to use the selection pane 
and I'm going to select all of the shapes just by holding down my shift key and all of those cards. And we're going to group them together. So now they're one big block, control C to copy. Let's go across to 2017, control V to paste. Let's paste it on all of these different pages and then we can go in and we can change our filters. Perfect. So let's go back to 2017. Let's deal with the formatting changes we need to make first of all. So we're going to ungroup the elements because I want this to match my theme. So here I have blue. So I'm going to select these bars first of all. And we want to change that fill color to a nice blue. And then we're going to go through and we're going to change the font color to blue as well. So into formatting, we want to format the data label. We want this to be blue and also we want the category. Let's make that a slightly darker blue like so. So once we have this, we can then copy that formatting across to the others. Now remember, if you are copying and pasting formatting, then sometimes that can change the number formatting that you've applied. And you can see that that's happening just there. So I'm going to go back through and just change the data labels to reflect the correct display units. And there we go. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to change the formatting on each of these pages. So join me back here in a couple of moments. So the final thing we want to do here is we want to apply some filters so that we're just seeing the relevant information for the page. So on this all page, we don't need to do anything here because we want to see all of the data summarized. However, if we jump across to 2017, we only want the cards to show the relevant data for the year 2017. So this is where we need to apply some filters. So let's expand out our filters pane. And I'm going to use the year filter from my dates table. So let's grab year and drag it into filters on this page. And the first thing we want to do here is change the filter type to basic filtering. And we can then go through and select the year we're interested in. So in this case, 2017. And you'll notice that all of those figures now update. Now it might be that once you change these, you want to then change the number formatting because total revenue 0.07 million, not particularly useful. So let's click, let's go into formatting. We're going to expand data label and we're going to change the display units to thousands. And I'm going to do the same here for total profit. Let me show you that once again for 2018 and then I'll leave you to do the others yourself. So for this one, we're going to expand the filters pane. Again, we're going to drag year onto the filters on this page change it to basic filtering and this time we're only interested in data that relates to 2018. And once again I'm going to change some of these so let's change this data label to thousands and also the total profit needs to go to thousands as well. So that is it pretty straightforward. I'm going to go and apply this same settings to 2019 and 2020 and then I'll see you in the next lesson. So the next thing that we want to add to our report is a line chart. And line charts are great for displaying time-based data. So if you want to see how a metric has changed over time, or if you want to compare two different metrics together over years, months, weeks, then line charts are great for that. So we're going to add a line chart that shows us how many female and how many male customers we've had over the year, because this type of metric can help us make better business decisions. Maybe I'm trying to decide what type of product I want to stock next year. And if I notice that we're getting an increasing number of female customers, maybe I want to stock more products that are aimed at females. Now, the way that we do this is going to be slightly different on the all page as opposed to the different year pages. On the all page, I'm happy to see a line chart that compares female to male customers year on year. Whereas on the other pages, I want to specifically look at that year and it's going to be more beneficial for me to see the trend over the months of that year. 
So let's start out with our first line chart on the All page. I'm going to go to Visualizations and select Line Chart. Again, it's a little bit too wide, so let's make this smaller. I'm going to move it up to here and kind of position it where I want it to be. So let's do something like that for the time being. Now I need to add in my fields. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab the year field from my dates table and I want this to run across the horizontal axis at the bottom. So let's drop it into axes. What values do I want to display on this chart? Well, I want to display female versus male customers and I have measures for this set up already. So let's grab male customers and drop that into values. And then let's grab female customers and drop that into values as well. And you'll see as soon as I do that, it automatically adds a legend for me. So what can I see here? I can see we have a sharp drop off around 2020. And I'm going to say that that is because of the pandemic. Sales in general have been down. So now I can do a little bit of formatting on this chart. So let's jump across to formatting. And you can see here that I have some warning symbols next to the legend, the X and the Y axes. And if you see this, if you hover over, it says the visual is responsive to return the legend font to its original size, enlarge the visual. So it's basically telling me that my visual isn't quite large enough. So as soon as I take that up a little bit more, those warning symbols disappear. Now for this, I do want to keep the legend so we know what each of those series mean. Let's go to X axes. Now, I don't think there are too many changes I want to make to the X axes. What about the Y axes? No, I'm fairly happy there as well. I don't want to change any of the font sizes. So let's just leave that one be. Um, data colors. Now, this is something I do want to change so that it matches with my theme. So we're going to have male customers are going to be the dark green and then female customers. Let's do a contrasting color. Let's do a yellow. Now, data labels, what happens if I turn these on? Well, it's going to give me the values at each of the points on that line chart. Now, that looks a bit chaotic to me, so I'm going to turn that off. Let's go down to shapes, because this is where I can define if I want to show any markers. And if I turn those on, I'm going to get those markers on my line chart. And I actually quite like those because they pinpoint the years quite nicely. I can also define my marker shape. So if I don't like those circles, I could change it to something else. I can change the marker size and even the marker color. Now I'm not going to change the color. I'm quite happy with how those look. And one cool thing I could do is if I turn on stepped instead of lines, it's going to show me that kind of stepped layout for those values. Now I'm going to turn that off, but just be aware that that is in there. Now, what else do I want to do in here? What about these titles? We can see currently I have male customers and female customers by year at the top just here. Now, if you want to leave that, that's absolutely fine. I'm going to turn mine off because I'm going to add a text box for this instead, because I have a bit more control over the format. Now, one thing I do want to change is I do want to change this Y axis title because it's a little bit long and it's going off of the page. So instead of trying to find this option throughout these categories, I'm simply going to use my search and type in axis title. And there we go. So now I can change the Y axis title. So I'm going to call this male versus female customers so that that fits on a little bit better. And there we go. I'm pretty happy with how this line chart looks. So now that we've done this one, I'm going to copy it. Let's jump across to 2017. Control V to paste it in. Now we need to make some changes just here, because remember, this whole report page is filtered to show information just for the year 2017. So currently look at my line chart, it has 2017 and then we just have two points. So it's not really displaying correctly. So what I would rather have here is to show the trend over the months of 2017. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the year field from the axes and we're going to replace it with the month name field. And now I can see that trend over the different months. Now, one point here that's really important to know. Notice that my month names are not in order. They don't start at January. They're currently starting at March. So what we're going to do here is we are going to click on the visual. We're going to click the three dots and we're going to say sort ascending. 
we're then going to go back into those three dots and say sort by month name. And that's going to order those months correctly. So now that we've done that, we can go through and we can apply some formatting. And there's not a great deal that I need to change here, but I am going to change those data colors just so that they match this particular page. Our male customers are going to be a dark blue and our female customers are going to be a lighter blue color. Let's do it one more time. Control C, jump across to 2018, Control V to paste. And simply all we need to do here is just change those data colors. So we're going to do a dark orange for our male customers and a lighter orange for our female customers. And that's pretty much it. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to do exactly the same for 2019 and 2020. So in the last lesson, we added some line charts into our reports to show the count of male versus female customers. And since then, I've done a small change. If you recall, I turned off the titles for all of these charts because I wanted to add my own using a text box. And the reason why I like to do this is just because it gives me a little bit more formatting control over that title. So what I've done here is I've added my own title and I've just added this simply using a text box and changing the background fill. So we have one for all years. And if we go across to 2017 and then 2018, you can see how they differ. So now that we have these line charts, it's time to add our next visualization. And the next one we're going to add is going to be a stacked column chart. And this stacked column chart is going to show me the total revenue per region. So over to the visualizations panel and it is this one here that we're going to use the 100% stacked column chart. So let's click to add. So this is fairly straightforward. We want to display the total revenue by region. So I'm going to go to my KPI measures table. There's my total revenue measure. Let's drag and drop that into values. And then what I want to do is break this down by region. So let's go down to our state region table and I'm going to grab the region and drag that into legend. And there we go. We can now see we have Midwest, Northeast, South and West. So really nice and simple. Now I'm going to want to do some formatting on this as always. Let's jump across to formatting. I can see here I've got those warning symbols again. So I do need to make this a little bit bigger. There we go. And the first thing I'm going to do here is turn off that title because we're going to create our own. Let's go to our data colors and change these because currently they don't really match my theme. So for Midwest, let's go for that green color. For Northeast, let's go for yellow. And then I think I'm going to do a blue color for South and then finally an orange for West. And another thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to display the data labels on the stacked column because this makes it super clear what the breakdown of those percentages are. Now, another little effect you can add to these data labels is you can choose to show a background and you'll see if I do that, I kind of get this little shaded transparency and you can change that color if you want to. And you can even make them less transparent by dragging that slider. And sometimes that can look quite effective. So I think I'm going to leave those on and set the transparency to 64. And the final thing I'm going to do here is just resize this so that it's a bit smaller. Now, now that I've resized this, this column has actually got a lot thinner and I would like that to be a little bit wider. So what we can do here is go to X axis. And if we scroll down, we have a little setting here for inner padding. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this all the way down and just make that column a little bit wider. And the final little change is I'm going to remove the region label on the legend. So for this, we want to expand legend and I can just say title off. And I think that looks pretty good. So now I can do exactly the same. I can grab this chart, control C, go to the next page, control V to paste that in. 
And remember, we don't need to do anything to tell this chart that we only want to see the data for 2017 because we have our filters automatically applied to this page. Again, the only things I might want to do here are change the colors so that they match the theme of this page. So let's quickly do that and then I'll leave you to do the others yourself. So let's jump into data colors. And for this one, we've kind of got a blue theme going on here. So let's do a dark blue. Uh, let's do a lighter blue. In fact, we're going to make all of these a blue color. And there we go. It's as simple as that. So I'll leave you to copy these across to the other pages. But one thing I will show you before we leave is I'm just going to add another one of these titles. So let's go back to the all page. And I'm just going to move this down and get it out the way. I'm going to grab this text box, control C, control V to copy. And we're going to move this and make it a little bit smaller. We basically want to make it the same width as the chart underneath. Now I'm going to drag this chart up very slightly so that everything matches nicely. And you might want to change the color of the heading. I'm not going to in this case. So this one is showing total revenue by region. And we'll just put all in brackets. Let's apply some formatting. So we're going to change this to white. We're going to make it bold and we're going to make that slightly bigger. Let's take that up to 11. So really straightforward to add in those text boxes. That's pretty much it. I'm going to go away and I'm going to copy this chart across to the other years and make the same customizations. The next visualization that we're going to add is a tree map chart. And what a tree map chart does is it shows some tiles and the size of each tile is dependent on the value. So for example, maybe I want to create a tree map chart which shows the number of sales, the order count effectively by year. So the size of each year's tile be determined by the number of orders. So let's take a look at how we might do that. So I'm currently clicked on the all page. I'm going to go to my visualizations and it's this one that we want just here, the tree map. Let's drag this down so we can see it a bit better. And I'm going to make this a little bit wider. So now we just need to add our fields. And the first field we need to add is basically what we want to group by. So I want to see the number of orders by year. So my group is going to be the year. So across to my dates table, let's grab year and drag that into group. Now I need to provide some values. So I want one of my measures, which is the order count. And let's drag and drop that into values. And now you can see what we get. So each tile is a different size based on the value contained within. Now we'll say with my data, a lot of these values are very close together, which is why we have a lot of tiles which look like they're pretty much the same size. But if we hover over, we can see in the tooltip, for example, 2020 has 450 orders, whereas 2019 has 471. So the difference between some of these isn't large enough to make a real impact on the size of the tile. So just bear that in mind. This can work really well with certain types of data. However, with the data that we're using, it still gives a pretty good representation and it's a really eye catching way to display data as well. Now, I think that I want this tree map to be up here at the top. So I'm going to do a little bit of rearranging. I'm going to select my chart and its title. And I think I'm going to group these together to make them a bit easier to move. So let's drag this down and I'm going to replace it with this up here because I think that fits into that gap quite nicely. Now you could go through and start customizing all the colors of all the different tiles. I'm not going to do that. I'm quite happy with how these look as they are. However, I am going to remove the title or turn the title off because we're going to create our own title. So once again, let's just grab one of these titles, control C, control V to copy it. And I'm going to give this a different name. So this time we're showing the count of orders by year. And again, I'm just going to put all in brackets. Let's make some changes to this. So we're going to make that 11 and also 
bold and we want to make sure that that font is white. Remember, you could use the Format Painter here to apply all of those formatting properties. So now that we have that, let's move everything nicely into place. So let's drag this one up to the top and drag our tree map up just there. And we want to make sure that it's the same size. And there we go. Now I'm going to copy this visualization across to the other pages because again, we have to do something slightly different here. So much like with this line chart, if I'm looking at the 2017 page, I would rather see a breakdown of orders by month as opposed to year. So control C, let's jump across to 2017, control V to paste in. And you can see by default, because this whole page is filtered just to show 2017 data, that's all I'm currently getting in this tree map. So we want to replace how we're grouping this data. So instead of year, we're going to remove that. I want to do month name instead. And what I should find out getting here are all of those different months. So let's do some rearranging once again. I'm going to group both of these together and move this little stacked column chart out the way. Let's control C, control V to copy this heading and drag that across. And we want to change this title. So once again, this is going to be count of orders by month. Let's drag our tree map up and position that underneath that heading. So again, super straightforward. Now actually come to think of it, one thing I might want to add on to here are some data labels. So I can see the actual order count on the tile as opposed to just in that tooltip. So let's go back to all. I probably should have done this first, but I forgot. So let's try that again. I'm going to click on the tree map. Let's go into formatting and I'm going to display data labels. Now let's format these a little bit. I'm going to keep them on white. I'm happy with the display units, but I think I'm going to make them a little bit bigger. So we're going to make these quite nice and big. I'm going to take them up to 17 points. So again, very straightforward. Let's do the same for 2017 whilst we're here. Let's jump into data labels. Let's turn those on and we're going to take that text size up to 17. And remember, you can just type it in. And these data labels are particularly good if you have data that's similar to mine, where all of the values are very close together and it's not as easy to see what that value is based on the tile size. So I'm going to go through and add this tree map to the other pages. I will leave you to do the same. The next visualization that we're going to add to this report is a funnel chart. And a funnel chart is a great way of determining the distribution of values across specified criteria. So maybe I want to see the distribution of customer age because this in turn could help me make better business decisions for next year. If the majority of my customers are within the age range of 20 to 30, then I might want to start stocking products that are more relevant for that age group. So let's take a look at how we can add one of these funnel charts. So we're going to go across to our visualizations pane and the funnel chart is this one just here. So let's click it to add it in. So now we need to define our fields. And the first thing I need to specify here is what I want to group these distributions by. Well, I'm interested in grouping together all of our orders by the age of the customer that submitted the order. So if I go across to my fields and to my orders table, I have a field here called age in years. So I'm going to drag and drop that into group. And then in the values area, well, I want to find out how many customers we have within each age group. So for this, I can use the count of orders or the order count field. So let's grab this from the KPI measures table and drop it into values. Now, currently you can see that my funnel chart is rather busy looking. It's quite hard to tell from this exactly what we're looking at. So instead of this very detailed breakdown, I might want to split the ages into different age buckets. 
So maybe 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 60 and above. So what we can do here is we can jump across to where we have the group age and years, click the drop down and select new group. And this will allow us to divide this data into different buckets or bins as they're termed here. Now you can see here, it's going to use the age in years, which is perfect. The group type is going to be a bin. I also have list just here. And you can see it's picked up the minimum value and the maximum value in my data set. So all of my customers are between 21 years and 60 years of age. I can then choose the bin type. So how do I want to define this bin size? I can choose the size of the bins or the number of the bins. Now I want to separate up my bins into 10 year groups. So I'm going to choose size of bins and my bin size is going to be 10 years. The other option in here, number of bins, if I wanted a specific number of bins, so maybe five, I could choose that and then Power BI will distribute my customers based on the number of bins I've selected. But I'm going to do size of bins, click on OK and check out what has happened. So running down the side here, I have my different ages. And once again, you can see that these aren't ordered correctly. We have 40, then 30, then 50, then 20. So I'm going to want to sort that out. So let's click more options. We're going to keep the sort in descending order, but we're going to sort by the age in years. And now that looks a little bit better, although I do want to swap this around. So let's say sort ascending. So there we go. Now these are ordered correctly. So now I can see that I have 2,152 customers that are between 20 and 30, 2,330 customers that are between 30 and 40, and my largest group, so this is really going to be my target audience, is the age group 40 to 50 with 2,559 customers. So now that we have our funnel chart, let's do some tidying up and some formatting. So let's go across to our formatting area. And the first thing I'm going to do here is turn off that title. Now, another thing I want to do is I'm going to change the data colors. So let's click the drop down and I'm going to select this green. And as for these data labels, well, I want those to be a little bit more specific. So let's expand this one and we're going to change the display units to none. And that's going to give me the exact value. I want them positioned on the inside center. The other option I hit, have here is outside end, which for this I don't think looks too great. So let's put those back into the center. Another thing I want to get rid of is this 100% bar at the top and this 0.1% at the bottom. And that is this little conversion toggle. So if we turn that off, it's going to get rid of both of those. So this now looks a lot cleaner. And actually, I think I'm going to change these bars to a different color because our title is going to be green. So I think we might have too much green going on if we have the same color bars. So let's change the data colors and let's go for that yellow color in there. And I think that looks a little bit better. So now that we've done that, we can add our title. So let's control C and control V to add another one of those. I'm going to drag this down and let's just position it just there. And then we can do a little bit of rearranging. So I'm going to make that the same size and possibly move that down very slightly. And there we go. So now all I need to do is change this heading. So this is age distribution distribution of customers. And that looks perfect. Now I think I am going to move this in because this doesn't really need quite as much room. And there we go. So now all I need to do is exactly the same as we've done before and copy and paste this across to the other pages. The final visualization we're going to add to our reports is a matrix table. And a matrix table just allows you to show multiple dimensions of data in a table. So let's jump straight into our visualizations pane and we're going to choose matrix. And I'm going to drag this over and just position it in the spare bit of space that we have just here. So we're going to put it about there and let's drag the bottom of this down. 
and drag this in and that fits perfectly. So basically what I want to display in this table is I want to see how many orders we've had broken down by order type, payment type and order status. So in the rows I'm going to grab the payment type field and I'm going to drag and drop that into rows. And you can see now we have card, cash and voucher. Then I want to break that down further by order type. So let's grab the order type field and I'm going to drop that down into rows as well. And as soon as I do that, I get my plus symbols next to each, which means I can drill down into each of these items. I now want to add some columns and for this, I want to see the breakdown by order status. So I can see if that is pending, returned or shipped. And then finally in the middle, I want to use my count of orders measure and I'm going to drag that into values and take a look at that. Remember, if you want to expand all of these in one go, if we use our little icons just above, this one just here will expand down one level in the hierarchy. So now it's very clear for me to see this breakdown. Let's jump across to formatting because one of the things I'm going to do here is I'm going to change the matrix table style from default to my preferred table style, which is minimal. And if I expand grid, I'm going to turn on the vertical grid. I'm going to leave those vertical grid lines as that light gray color. And I think I'm going to leave all of the grid lines the color that they are. I quite like just that very faint light gray color. Let's go down to column headers. Well, here I can do things like change the font color, the background color. And I think for this, we're going to change the font color. Let's make those a darker blue. And I'm going to do the same for the row headers. So we're going to make those a darker blue as well. And I think that's all I'm going to do here. I don't really need to do too much fussing around with this one. Now, whilst this table fits in perfectly into this allotted space, we do still need to add our title. And because we're adding a title, it means that we're going to get a scroll bar on this data, which I don't mind too much. So let's copy, control C, control V, and I'm going to drag this over. And we want to change this title because this is now showing us count of customers by, we'll just say type and status. So let's just resize our table down. I'm going to resize this little header and move that into position. Then we can move our table up a little bit and also drag it down. And actually, you know what? That still fits pretty perfectly. I do have a scroll bar, but it's just a very small scroll bar at the side there. So look at that. That looks beautiful. So now I'm going to copy this across to my other pages. So let's click on the table. Let's click on that heading. We're going to right click. We're going to group them together. Control C to copy. Let's jump across to 2017. Once we've pasted it in, we can ungroup the items and then we can make the formatting changes. So for this, I am simply going to change the background fill of this title. So select any of the titles, click on Format Painter, and that's just a quick way of applying that formatting. And remember, because this entire page has a filter on it, I don't need to apply any additional filters to see just the results for 2017. So I'm going to go away and I'm going to copy this matrix table and that little heading across to all of the other pages. So the final thing I'm going to do to this matrix table is I'm going to add some conditional formatting so that my highest and lowest numbers really stand out from one another. So for this, we're going to open up the visualizations pane, jump into formatting, and we want to expand conditional formatting towards the bottom. So I'm going to apply two pieces of conditional formatting to this matrix table. The first thing I'm going to apply is a background color. And this is going to shade the background of the cells according to the values contained within them. Now I'm going to jump straight into advanced controls because I do want to make some changes here. Now I want to format it lowest value to highest value. So for my lowest value, let's change this color. So I'm going to go to more colors because I want to keep in with this theme. So we're going to go into the kind of tealy blue range and let's go for quite a light color. 
I'm going to choose something like that. And then for my highest value, we're going to do a darker teal. Let's click on OK. And now you can see what that looks like in the table. So the darker the teal color, the higher the value. What I'm also going to add in here is some icon sets. So let's scroll down and turn on our icons. I'm going to jump into advanced controls and let's change this to a different icon set. I think I'm going to go for these ones just here. Now remember, by default, because I've selected three icons, Power BI is going to look at the data in that table and divide it into thirds and assign an icon accordingly. So the lowest values, the ones within the lowest third, are going to have a red icon, the ones in the middle third are yellow, and the ones in the top third are green. So if I now click on OK, it's very obvious for me to see where I've had my highest orders. And again, this is just a really nice visual way of highlighting certain pieces of data. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to add the same conditional formatting to my other matrix tables. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the course exercise files and follow along with this video, click over there and click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.